Hey creepypasta fans, it's Joseph with the Dark Cosmos. Enjoy tonight's sci-fi horror story, and remember, stay cosmic. A storm was approaching. I could see the dark clouds cluster in the distance as the cold breeze swept through the forest. The trees trembled under the force of the incoming breeze as the sound of thunder echoed in the distance. I had picked up high levels of radiation in the heart of Lockwood Forest, and from the look of it, whatever was buried deep in the earth was definitely worth digging up. My radiation detector device was all over the place, and despite warnings of an incoming storm, I sank my shovel deep into the earth and began to dig. The clouds soon descended as rain started pouring just as my shovel came into contact with something within the earth. I had finally gotten closer to my prize and this gave birth to a sudden burst of energy. I began to dig faster. My eyes were soon greeted by a strange sight. What in the world? I exclaimed, and instantly jerked back in shock. I had spent decades as a researcher, and I was confident that whatever I had just seen was definitely not from this world. My heart raced faster as I shifted my gaze back to the strange fossil. I needed to get this immediately to my laboratory. Somewhere in the dark cosmos, an unidentified object can be seen heading towards the Earth with unreal speed. It looks like some sort of spaceship. Carl does a double take at his screen to be sure he was not seeing things. He had been working at the Space Control Center for a while, but this was unlike any strange object he has seen before. Sir Logan, I, I think you need to see this! Carl's voice echoed throughout the room. Keep a close watch on the objects. If you notice anything strange, report instantly to HQ. A husky voice replied. Yes, sir. The storm had calmed and I was able to unearth the sinister looking fossil. I was now moments away from making a groundbreaking discovery. Several thoughts strolled across my mind as I stormed into the military research lab. I carted away the strange fossil towards my laboratory, responding to several salutations at intervals as I continued down the path. I could sense several curious eyes staring at me, but I was not bothered. I had a great task ahead and Time was not a luxury that I had. The evening sun cast an orange hue across the sky as darkness began to creep in slowly. One thing was certain. I wasn't going to sleep until I had completed my research. The fossil was at least seven feet tall with indescribable features and several extended appendages protruding from different parts of its body. A spherical structure that seemed like its head sat above its distorted body. Right from my childhood, I had always been interested in xenobiology, the speculative biology of extraterrestrial life forms, and despite several remarks from a few of my colleagues in the military, I furthered my research even after joining the army. I had taken several samples from the fossil, and had already begun to process my findings when I drifted into oblivion. I was, however, drawn back from my oblivious state by the beeping sound of one of the machines. I was right. The fossil was definitely not from this planet, but that wasn't what caught my attention. The results also revealed that whatever I had just dug out from Lockwood Forest was older than mankind itself. It predated back to the age of the dinosaurs. I ran the investigation again several times to be sure, but the results all came out the same, every time. I stared at the results in shock. We were not the first inhabitants of the Earth. Something else walked the length and breadth of the Earth before we ever came into existence. Something massive and totally different from us. Something alien. Not like it mattered anyway. I was proud to have made such a groundbreaking discovery, but these creatures were most likely extinct, and this discovery will probably end up in some museum downtown. But now, I know that we might not just be the only ones in the universe. I needed to get some sleep. I took a quick glance at the alien fossil before strolling out of my laboratory. Everyone in the space control center held their breaths as they stared at the strange disc-like structure which hovered in the large screen right in front of them. They had been monitoring the strange objects since it gained entry into our stratosphere, and it was now obvious that there was something strange about this particular unidentified flying object. It strolled across the sky like it had a mind of its own. Was this some sort of weapon of war by a nation? Rumors spread like wildfire, but every nation denied involvement. 
Only a few people knew where the strange object had come from. What do we do now, sir? Carl asked curiously, fear evident on his face. We wait. We are not sure about... He was still speaking when the unidentified flying object came to a sudden halt. When the unidentified flying object came to a sudden halt on the coast of Riverlandville. It was definitely an alien ship. Carl trembled in fear as he thought of what could probably happen next. This, th this is not good, he stammered. Every news channel in the world was talking about the strange object, which descended from the heavens, but so far, no attack had been launched. Well, not until now. Suddenly, an ominous noise emanated from within the spaceship, as a powerful surge of energy pulsated around it. I was glued to the TV which hung calmly on the wall in my office, stunned at the sudden turn of events, my military uniform glittering under the fluorescent light. Logan! I shifted my gaze towards the source of the sound. We need to go. Now! It was my colleague. If this was really what I thought it was, then no one was safe. I was about to leave my office when the surge of energy that had been pulsating around the strange object suddenly erupted throughout the coast of Riversideville. And scores of sinister looking creatures emerged from within, like the disc-like object. I have never seen these creatures before, but I will recognize their unique biology anywhere. They have very similar features to the fossil I had unearthed just a few days ago. Could this be a coincidence? I asked myself. I silenced my thoughts immediately. Now was no time for unnecessary debates as I immediately grabbed my gun and stormed out of my office. Whatever just came out from that ship was definitely not a friendly next door neighbor, and I had a duty to protect my country at any cost. Carl, they didn't need any more signs. It was an alien invasion. It sounded like some sort of fantasy tale, but it wasn't. It was real. In the midst of the growing chaos, a familiar voice echoed in the control hall of the Space Mission Control Center. Carl, get the president on the line. I was very close to the coast of Riversideville, so I was at the forefront of the war. Nothing seemed to make sense, but it was no time to use our heads. We fought with everything we had. The aliens were totally not friendly. They launched everything they had, but we fought back hard. Luckily, our weapons could pierce their thick flesh. They were repelled with heavy force, and their attack was contained. The Battle of Riversideville lasted for about a week before we were able to take down their ship. We might have won the battle, but the new revelation that we were not alone in the universe haunted every mother and child. The aliens hovered in the air with multiple extensions beside their bodies. They launched their attacks through several pores on their bodies, which shot out acid-like substances and disintegrated anything upon contact. Luckily for me, I was permitted to run experiments on one of the captured aliens. I had the license to do as I wanted. Firstly, I ran bone samples and realized that I was right. It was a perfect match to the fossil I had dug up from Lockwood Force just a few days ago. Perhaps they had been to Earth before. Or maybe they were the first inhabitants of the Earth. Either way, they had been around a long time before man. What if they just wanted their planet back? I asked myself. What if this ship was just a scouting party to check out what was on Earth? How did they communicate? Several questions began to stroll across my mind as I drifted into oblivion. If they had been on the Earth before man, then there was only one thing that would bring them back. They wanted their planet back. I informed my superiors, and a few of them saw some wisdom in my words, and I advised them to be ready for another invasion. Various conspiracy theories began to circulate the internet about the origin and intention of the aliens, but I feared that none of that might matter if they decided to return for another invasion. Two weeks after the previous attack, something appeared like stars in the midnight sky. We wanted to doubt it, but we all knew what it was. The aliens were back and this time, they had returned prepared for war. My fears had become reality. World leaders met to discuss the best way to tackle the incoming threat. They resolved to be the first to launch an attack. It was already clear that the aliens had not come in peace. 
they had brought their entire species, which indicated that they had no plans of losing the war. Earth had never been faced with such a situation before. We had just found out that we were not alone in the universe just a few weeks ago, and now we were at the brink of war and total extinction from an alien species. We fired several missiles toward them, but they all exploded before even getting close to them. They seemed to have surrounded themselves with the powerful force field and this seemed to pose a more tasking situation. We needed another plan, and we needed a plan fast as the aliens were still descending into Earth's orbit. The spaceship soon entered the Earth and the aliens were released into the Earth. The aliens had come to a halt, hovering exactly where their previous spaceship had also been. That was where their mother shop had decided to perch, very closely to Riversideville. And once again, I was at the forefront of the war. War had broken out all around the world, and every continent in the world was at war. It was very difficult for other countries that were not affected by the first invasion direction, and the death toll soon began to increase. Never has the world experienced an invasion as terrible as this. We had lost too many men in a very short time, and the war seemed endless. We were losing, and something had to be done. The mothership was almost impenetrable, but we had an alien in our hold. The alien was going to be our passport into the mothership. I had studied their species for quite some time, and through my knowledge of the aliens, we blocked off its communication ports and using advanced drones. We carried the alien creature very close to the portal, and it responded and gave way. That was our chance. We launched several missiles through the open space and towards the mothership. For my research, I discovered that all the aliens were connected to their queen, who resided within the mothership. Most of the missiles which were shot in were destroyed, but one made it through and I made a discovery that could change the course of the war, but I was going to need a lot of firepower to help me get close enough to execute my plan. I knew a friend who could get to the president. In the advent of war, prices had to be paid. Carl invited me to speak with a few of his colleagues, and if I could convince him about my plan, then they might just be able to grant me an audience with the president of Riversideville. It, it, it's just like in the movies, I began. I could spot Carl listening in the distance. Their queen is like the source of life and existence. If we can take out their queen, they're all going to definitely fall, I said. And how do you know that? Carl asked curiously. Several missiles were fired at the queen, weakening the force field around her. One of the missiles accidentally found its way into her nest and came in contact with her. All the aliens seemed to feel the pain simultaneously. If if only we could get close to her, close enough and, and detonate a nuclear bomb in her nest. I, I'm positive that it should work. Somehow, I prayed in my heart that they listened to what I was saying. And who would do that? We all know that whoever strolls into that place would not come out alive. One of the men in the room asked curiously. I will, I replied instantly. An instant decorum engulfed the entire room as everyone stared at me with surprise. After a brief moment, Carl finally decided to break the silence. All right then, we'll make the call. The queen's nest was as big as the size of a stadium. I had taken the offer. Someone needed to get close enough to the queen for the bomb to be very efficient, and I had decided to take that seat. Everyone had given me a salute of respect before I embarked on the mission, and here I was, alone in the chopper preparing to jump from above into the belly of the beast. I would say it was an honor to have served my nation until my last breath. I heaved a heavy sigh before jumping off the chopper and into the queen's nest. I could hear several melodies ring in my ears. It was truly an honor. I descended into the queen's nest and when I'd got close enough, I pulled the trigger. A binding light filled the entire place as the queen gave a dying scream. Like the sands on a seashore, a swim of souls swimming in pace. Hey Creepypasta fans, it's Kira with The Dark Cosmos. Enjoy tonight's sci-fi horror story, and remember, stay cosmic. <laughs> we made it! Oliver exclaimed as soon as our spaceship landed on the surface of Mars, but I wasn't so sure about it. Looks like it. 
I mumbled. But let's double check all our systems. Something doesn't feel right. Are you kidding? My co-pilot laughed at me. We're on Mars, Natalie. We succeeded like nobody else has. Let's go out there! He sounded delighted. His laughter wasn't mean-spirited. He was just teasing me, but I couldn't find it in myself to celebrate just yet. It can't be this easy, I whispered under my breath. We didn't have a single inconvenience or unexpected issue in our entire journey. Even the landing was as smooth as possible. But my mind was plagued by nightmares. Horrible scenarios danced behind my eyelids and I felt them even more real than if I had been sleeping. The thing is, I knew I wanted to be an astronaut since I was a kid. And as I grew up, I became more aware of the extensive requirements and challenges I would have to face. But it was only in recent years, the last of my training preparing me for this mission to Mars, that my colleagues really shared with me the dangers waiting for me in space. It was part of the preparation process. I needed to know all of the possible threats, so I could learn ways on how to deal with them. This meant I had to sit through detailed stories about how everyone before me failed on this exact mission. Asteroids I couldn't dodge, fires they couldn't put out, malfunctions in the system or the spacesuits, lack of oxygen or fuel, and on one rare occasion, an extended period of time locked in with bad company in a small space resulted in two pilots fighting each other to death. Mostly we only received the last few seconds of audio or a satellite's photograph of the moment something exploded on the Red Planet. The fact that we only received crumbs as news on the life or death of our colleagues was demoralizing at best, traumatizing at worst, except for that unusual care. On the last message from that mission that reached Earth, there was a bone-chilling recording of the audio of their fight, one of the astronauts screaming with utter desperation. He bit my ear! He bit my fucking ear! He's going to kill me! He's lost his fucking mind! That recording was never made public, and it was so disturbing it was kept as a secret to most people at NASA, and only used as a warning to the people that were nearing their first mission to Mars. I never recovered from it. I could hear those shattered screams in the back of my head, even as my dear friend and reasonable partner hugged me. He was elated as he led me down and out of the spaceship. He held my hand as we took our first steps on Mars's surface, but my soul was incapable of finding solace. I didn't feel an ounce of calm. I only attempted to act confident and excited for his sake, but Oliver saw right through me. <laughs> what? Are you scared? He laughed. I scoffed in response. His kind eyes let me know he genuinely cared about me, and he wanted me to enjoy this as much as he was. Teasing me like this wasn't exactly a bad strategy. I'm not scared, I smirked. It was my first sincere smile since we left the planet Earth. All right, then let's go exploring. Let's go, let's go. Oliver suggested with a grin. We went through all the necessary protocols for first arriving on Mars, and then we granted ourselves some free time to explore Mars's surface with our own eyes. It was a breathtaking sight. Since all of the missions to Mars started failing, it seemed that we knew less and less about our neighboring planet. At least, we knew enough to build a vehicle capable of driving two pilots around on the surface of the planet. Oliver and I got out of the ship, and then we were on our way. I dreamed of this my entire life, and it felt like magic. I constantly looked over my shoulder and restlessly checked the controls of the small vehicle, but I was starting to relax. That was when Oliver said to me in an uneasy tone, Uh, Natalie? Does the Mars rover still work? No, it doesn't. I shook my head. Every person we sent to this planet died, and every machine exploded. Then, why is it coming towards us? I looked over in the direction Oliver was pointing to, but by the time I looked, the little thing was actually turning around and moving at full speed away from us. Oh my god, I whispered. That can't be right. We have to go find it, right? I hadn't even finished the sentence when Oliver turned our vehicle around and drove us as fast as he could in the same direction as the ghost of the rover. Our vehicle couldn't go that fast, but we were certainly a little faster than the small robot. At first, we discussed amongst ourselves possible explanations for the resurrection of the rover, but as we got closer to it, I grew quiet. That feeling of anxiety came over me again. We weren't safe. 
Just because we had landed didn't mean we could return to Earth, couldn't we? As we rounded a small hill, we came across the first sight of disaster. The remnants of one ship that came before us. Oliver pulled the brakes so harshly I nearly fell off the vehicle. We gasped at the same time. It was one thing knowing that some ships broke down the second they landed on Mars. It was something very different, seeing the catastrophe with our own eyes. That huge carcass in the middle of a lifeless desert felt like coming across a full skeleton of a fossilized dinosaur. In fact, we were entering the graveyard of failed missions to Mars. When we recovered from the shock, we kept driving, much slower now, but the surprises kept coming. After driving past that broken ship, we were able to see another one, not too far away, and another, and another, for as far as we could see. We moved forward, but then there was the first sound. What was that? I wondered. Something could have fallen down from those ruins. Oliver tried to soothe me, but his expression betrayed him. He was as unsettled as me. A few meters later, a similar sound came from the opposite direction. Both our heads snapped towards it, and our eyes desperately searched for an explanation. What the hell? Do you think it's the rover? Oliver asked me. I think we should leave, I replied. Yeah, no shit. Oliver agreed, but made no move to drive us away. The two of us looked around, jaws dropped, at the place we found ourselves in. We felt insignificant, surrounded by the ruins of older spaceships. We weren't lost, but it might not be so easy to return to our own ship. We were still assessing the situation when I realized something important. These were remnants of ships that broke down on Mars, but they were mostly in good conditions, except for the fact that they had pieces missing. Entire parts of the hull were pulled off the ships in a way that was so obviously not natural. I opened my mouth to say something about it to Oliver, but then we heard a new sound, louder, steady, and coming directly at us. We saw him in time, but the shock and fear paralyzed us. We could have done something. Damn, we should have done something. We could have dodged the attack. We could have tried to run. We could have attempted to fight back, but we didn't. We stood there with wide eyes, parted lips, and shaking hands as a strange man ran full speed towards us. He jumped at the vehicle and tackled us to the ground. We were still frozen. It was like time stopped. We were suspended for an eternity, experiencing the dull ache of the fall and hearing the ragged breathing and animal groans from the man on top of us. Then, as quickly as it happened, the spell broke, and all hell broke loose. Uh, let me go! Oliver yelled. But when he tried to stand up, the man on top of us slammed him right back down to the ground in a way that was clearly harder than before. The two of us thrashed around, and I'm sure I managed to kick the beast on top of us, but it didn't last long. New pairs of arms fell on us and dragged us away from the creature. I hesitated to call him a man. My eyes recognized a human body, but nothing else fit. He wore protective goggles over his eyes and an oxygen mask over his mouth and nose, but the rest of his head was unprotected. His screen had a sickly green tint and darkened veins protruding all over it. He didn't pronounce a word the entire time. He only groaned loudly and fumed at the mouth. Oliver and I struggled with all of our strength but there were at least two people dragging each of us away. My heart was beating faster than ever before. All of my fears were justified, but this was worse than all of my nightmares. This was unexplainable, and the confusion only scared me more. My partner and I exchanged looks of worry, and eventually, we stopped struggling so hard, realizing we were only making things worse. The unseen attackers dragged us through a maze of broken down ships while the green-faced man chased behind us with a grimace permanently etched onto his features. Finally, they dropped us down heavily on the ground. The fall took my breath away, but Oliver recovered faster and made a move to stand back up. But he froze up again. My eyes trailed upwards and immediately found the reason for his sudden terror. At our sides were standing two more greenish monsters, with the same goggles, masks, torn clothes, and messed up skin. But these two were holding some kind of handmade axes. Terrible things that were probably pulled from the pieces of the ships. The sharp edges were much bigger than their heads, and they looked beyond deadly. For a moment, there was a deep silence, and I was overcome by the hope that maybe this was all a bad dream. 
But then, I heard a loud static through the comms in my suit, followed by a loud click. We were connected to a new signal. Immediately, there came a voice addressing us. Welcome home. A new man said as he slowly walked towards us. He had a small limp, and he wore a ragged but functional spacesuit. I know it's a shock at first, but trust me, you will fit right in. What is this? Oliver exclaimed. He sounded equally enraged and terrified. The man finally stood in front of us and smiled. He was vaguely familiar, but he looked so worn down he was barely recognizable. Though I quickly guessed that if all of these men had made it to Mars, then I must have studied them at one point or another. Home, I told you. The old man smiled. You see, you weren't sent to Mars in a brave and glorious mission. You were kicked out of Earth, like all of us. That's bullshit, I interrupted him, but I was thoroughly ignored. These were suicide missions, but nobody cared about us. Everyone that tried to come here died until one of us decided it was enough. He survived, barely, but he cut off communications with the Earth. Then, one by one, we all followed in his footsteps and made a home for ourselves here. We prepared this home for you. Then Oliver asked a question that I believed unimportant at first. Who was that first one? The leader of these people took his time to answer, and every second of silence that passed made me feel like I was getting choked. Finally, his grin turned devilish as he replied. I believe he was your welcoming party. My eyes snapped to the side, looking for the sick man with the green skin and lost humanity. But he was nowhere to be seen. You're mad, I whispered, right before jumping to my feet and screaming at him. This is insane! Let us go! From the corner of my eye, I saw the men with the axes take a step towards me and raise their arms. But their leader clicked his tongue and they stood still. You are exaggerating, the man told me with a deep calm that infuriated me even more. It's in everyone's best interest that you start getting used to your new home. As you can probably guess, we can't afford to let you go back to Earth and share our little secret. And your attitude will determine what kind of life you'll get to lead here. So, act accordingly, choose wisely and you won't regret it. Now, my partner will give you a small tour of our home. Enjoy yourselves. He started walking away, and Oliver must have noticed that now my entire body was shaking. I couldn't move on from the shock of these completely crazy circumstances, but I couldn't ignore the feelings of rage, disgust, and immense fear for our lives. Oliver put a reassuring hand on my shoulder, and it helped. But a second later, we were facing three new men. All of them wore safe suits, but none of them looked quite content or healthy. Two of them were guards. They took Oliver and I by our arms and started leading us away. The third man walked between us in silence. When we were far away enough from the others, there was again a static coming through our comms, followed by a new click, the voice of the stranger coming through the secure line. They're going to take as many resources as they can from your ship, then they will blow it up to send their message to Earth. If we want to live, we have to be quick, understood? This man was plotting an escape with us, but first, he had a lot to explain. His voice was familiar though, and I just had to take one look at the side of his face to realize his identity, and that of his partner, and the leader of this place. He was missing half of his right ear. Hey Creepypasta fans, it's Keon with the Dark Cosmos. Enjoy tonight's sci-fi horror story. And remember, stay cosmic. Have you ever wanted to visit another planet? Have you ever wanted to see alien life forms with your eyes? Well, unfortunately, 
that won't be possible for some time. But the closest you can get to that experience is to go to Socotra Island off the coast of Yemen. What's so special about that island, you might ask yourself? Well, a quick search on the internet will answer most of your questions. Go to images. Pictures speak a thousand words, as the saying goes. But if you don't want to Google it, I'll describe it here. Imagine trees that look like mushrooms, and if you cut into them, they bleed red. Imagine a poisonous tree whose bark is tied around herd animals to ward off predators, which also doesn't need any soil to grow. The thing can root itself directly onto the rock. I can count all the 300-ish species endemic to the island, which cannot be found anywhere else on the planet, but I would be writing this all day. A bit of background on myself. I am a botanist. I specialize in the study of plants. To be specific, I specialize in plant ecology. Plant ecology is in layman's terms, the study of how plant life is distributed in the ecosystem, how they interact among and between other plants and living organisms, as well as how they shape the local environment. Back in 2010, I was working on my paper focused on the ecology of Socotra Island as part of my PhD. So, during the summer of that year, I decided to visit the island itself. Seeing the local flora firsthand is about as good as it gets, and it'll most likely give me bonus points in the paper. But, of course, it wasn't all about the PhD. I wanted to visit the island to see the frankly alien landscape. It's a once-in-a-lifetime experience. I began my journey by going to Cairo, Egypt. There, I took a layover flight to Seyun, then directly to Socotra Airport. The whole flight lasted for about four to four and a half hours. I was a bit tired from the flight once I landed. To make a long story short, I conducted some research there and saw the famous dragon's tree myself, bleeding and all. I'll save you from the details of the research in the paper. It isn't important in the story I'm about to tell. The island is a marvel, an alien one, but I'm not sure whether the plants originate from Earth or not. That is silly of me to say. Genetic evidence shows that they are related to other plant life on the planet one way or another. But I started to question that after I departed homeward. Now, once all was said and done, I decided to enjoy my remaining time on the island. I wanted to explore all the nooks and crannies of the place. Now... Another fun fact, the island has quite an extensive cave system, despite its relatively small size. The longest cave was about 3 kilometers in length, and that was one of the caves I visited. It was called the Hawk Cave. I and a few other tourists were guided by one of the locals to the cave, and we explored it for a bit. It was absolutely marvelous, gigantic too. I felt as if I was in a naturally formed cathedral when I was in there. Large pillars of stone went high above us, the light slowly fading as we went deeper inside, though we didn't go too deep. The local guide, let's call him Amir, that's not his real name, I'll withhold his real name for privacy's sake. He was a fantastic guide, and a fantastic person as well, and spoke excellent English as well. During my stay, he was the man who took me to any place of interest during my work, as well as took us caving. He and I grew close. He was an interesting guy to talk to. He was talkative and had many interesting stories to tell. I remember on the drive back, I was on the passenger seat. There were two other German tourists in the back, though they mainly conversed among themselves for the duration of the journey, only asking Amir a few questions here and there. I remember the conversation quite vividly, at least one part of it. That was quite a sight back there! <laughs> I chuckled. Amir smiled and replied, It was, it was, he said, turning the radio down a little bit. Uh, just out of curiosity, are there any other caves like this here? 
or any other interesting places? My flight is in two days. I'm sorry, I'm a nuisance. I said. Amir thought for a few moments before replying. Well, there is one place. It is interesting. Not so much for the view, but the stories about it, he said. Uh, what kind of stories? I asked. The older people tell us of how that place is cursed. Many people disappeared, never to return. I heard some did, but they were not themselves anymore. Though I do not believe any of that is true. He was cut off by a laugh from the passenger behind us. You can take us with you. You say, cursed place. It sounds interesting. One of the people behind said. No, no. Those are just stories to scare little children. There is nothing interesting up there, other than a small cave. I've been there myself and haven't found anything interesting. Well, nothing you haven't seen already, Amir said, turning his head a few times, looking at the passengers behind. Oh, if you say so, one of the passengers said, resuming their conversation in their native language. Other than the chatter of the two people in the back seat and the music playing on the radio, we were silent for the remainder of the drive, back to civilization. Once we finally arrived back at the hotel, I and the rest of the passengers exited the car. Once I grabbed my bag, I was about to close the door before Amir began to speak. Do you want me to drive you to that place? It is not far from here. No, it's getting late. I wouldn't want you to drive me to some little cave in the countryside. I said, Look, my friend, it is on me. No need to pay. It is not far from here. Twenty minute drive. Less. I started to have my suspicions at that moment. It was getting late. And he was offering to drive me in the middle of nowhere for free? This sounded like some sort of setup. I know. And I knew that then. But something told me he was being genuine and had no ill intent. He was a great guy thus far. And I... I was now really curious. <sighs> I sighed, put my bag back inside, and entered the passenger seat once again. Once I entered, he started driving. Where did that come from? I asked. What? Well, driving me to an, as you've said, an interesting place for free. Ah, that. Once you asked me about any other places, I was remembered that small cave outside the city. Though it isn't anything, uh, what's the word? Spectacular. It does have a halat muktalifa, different aura, since you reminded me, and you seem curious. I should take you there to see it. All right, now you've piqued my curiosity, I said. The rest of the drive was short. Once we got out of the city, we started going a winding dirt road for about 10 minutes. The sun began to set slowly on the horizon as we arrived at the place. He stopped abruptly on the dirt road before saying, We are here. We exited the car and he pointed towards the hills. It is up there. Follow me. I followed him up. We hitched hike for some time. I felt anxious. I was looking at him for any signs of movement that might indicate something was off. I tried to pay it no mind, but that was soon the least of my problems. I started to feel the aura he described. It was more of a feeling of impending doom. That something was not right, but you couldn't place your finger on it. And it wasn't on him. I could see he felt the same way. He was looking around the hills as I was. It was as if something was watching our every move with each step we took. Did we reach the cave? I asked. Yes, it is here. Get up here, he said as he pointed in front of him. Once I got up the hill, I could see the cave he was talking about. It wasn't small as he previously said, not as large as the one we visited. Medium-sized, I would say, but not in the least small. The opening was big enough to fit a large bus inside with room to spare. From the vantage point of the hill, it seemed ominous. The little sun there still was, was blocked by the hill. The cave was in a shade, though it wasn't too dark still. And if it does get dark, I brought a flashlight with me, thankfully. 
The anxiety I felt only grew once I saw it. But the weird thing was, I didn't want to go. I wanted to go inside for some absurd reason. I couldn't really tell why I felt attracted to the cave, as if it was beckoning me inside. I, uh, can we get a bit closer? I said. Amir looked at me as if I was insane before saying, Do as you would like. Just don't go inside. You will get lost. God forbid. I will be right behind you, he said. I simply nodded before starting to slowly descend the hill toward the cave opening. Once I got down there, I looked back to see Amir still there, waving to me. Don't be long. I gave him a thumbs up before getting closer. With each step, I felt as if that aura was getting stronger and stronger, and before I knew it, I entered the cave itself. It was pitch black inside. For some reason, I didn't need to reach my flashlight. It was like I knew where I was going. I could hear shouting behind me, Amir most likely, but his voice was muffled by the stone around me. Soon enough, I saw a light at the other end, an opening. I followed the light, tripping on a couple of stone protrusions along the way. As I exited the cave, I was met by light. A lot of light. The other weird thing was, after I took the first breath after getting out, I felt lightheaded. The way you feel when you hyperventilate when you have too much oxygen in your bloodstream. I, I felt dizzy. I also felt much lighter as if I lost 20 or 30 kilos the moment I stepped out. My entire body felt so, so light. Once my vision adjusted, I could see it was midday. The sun was high above. Well, the sun, the suns, there were two of them. One was orange-ish and about the same size as our own sun in the sky, while the other was smaller and had a blue hue. I rubbed my eyes a couple of times, thinking it was just my eyes playing tricks on me. But no, they weren't. The second thing I realized just then was the color purple. The sky had a purplish color to it. The grass, the plants, the tree leaves were all purple. I recognized the trees. They looked like the dragon trees I researched and saw myself. But these were taller, much taller. The average dragon tree grew between 5 to 10 meters in height, but these towered at least 20 to 25 meters, maybe even more. The vegetation was much denser than I had previously thought. Well, on Socotra at least. Amir! Amir! I started shouting. I was hyperventilating at this point. I never had trouble breathing before. I have no history of asthma. This was probably panic. The fact that my chest started to hurt didn't help in any way as well. I sat down on the ground to catch my breath, but it was difficult. After a few minutes of trying to breathe properly, I managed to find a tactic to not hyperventilate. I didn't take a full breath. I needed to breathe shallowly, if you will. But despite that my lungs seemed satisfied with that intake of air, I needed to be conscious of my breathing. It was difficult, but I managed. Once I got my act together, I looked around my vicinity for a better look. Though my eyes felt slightly irritated, I'm pretty sure that my eyes weren't lying. This wasn't the Socotra for sure. I looked behind me to see the cave missing. I tried not to panic again as to have another episode of hyperventilation. I tried my best to remain calm as possible. Amir, are you there? I shouted once again, but no answer. I started to walk back, well, in the direction where the cave would be. There was a steep hill where it was, where I swear the opening I came from was. I decided to climb it, and surprisingly, it was much easier than I thought it would have been. I did feel much lighter for some reason. After a few minutes of climbing up the steep hill, 
purple grass and strange flowers brushed my legs nearly to my knee at some point. I finally got up there, and what I saw... Jesus, it was a sight that was right out of a movie. A vast plain dotted with all kinds of life I've never seen before. Most of it was purple, but I saw a yellow brush. I saw red flowers in bloom that towered over the grass, dotted across the land. Some of the trees seemed familiar to the ones I saw, but others... Others were completely different. One of the trees I saw, only a couple, seemed to be at the very least 50 meters tall. They had a white and almost translucent trunk, with the branches going haphazardly in every direction. Its leaves were pinkish, and it had red, crimson red flowerings on its branches. Even from a distance, I could discern they looked akin to roses. I couldn't take the sight in completely before my eyes were averted to a dust cloud that was rising in the distance. There was a clearing in the trees where I saw a herd of animals. They looked like giraffes with long thin necks. But unlike the giraffes we know, they seemed to be white. I couldn't tell if they had fur or not. They were running from something. I couldn't see. I took a single step forward and slipped. I went tumbling down the hill. It felt as if I was falling in slow motion. It was a steep hill, but I should have been at the bottom much quicker. I, fortunately, was relatively unscathed by the unfortunate fall, but I had another problem now. A large plant, yellow leaves, and a purple trunk. It was taller than me and had a massive, unblossomed flower at the top. I could easily sit inside if it blossomed. I know that because it did blossom, well, open up when I fell right beside it. Once it did open up, I saw that it had teeth, rows upon rows of sharp translucent teeth. Its saliva dripped to the floor, dissolving the grass where it felt like a strong acid. Its head slowly inched closer to me as I backed off as quickly as I could. Once I got to my feet, it lunged at me extending its internal trunk to get closer to me. I barely avoided its mouth. Merely inches from me, it quickly closed it. Thankfully, it didn't catch me, but some of its salivae did burn through my pants. I got up and ran away as far as I possibly could from that monster. But I was not in the clear yet. I, I didn't realize I crossed quite a distance without getting winded. I realized that because the dust cloud of the giraffe-looking creatures was not too far away when I looked to the left. Oh, you've got to be fucking kidding me. I muttered to myself as I braced for the worst. I saw the towering creatures close the distance at a remarkable speed. And before I knew it, I was right in the middle of a stampede of dozens of creatures that would dwarf even some dinosaurs. I got on the floor and hoped, prayed, to every deity I knew of to let me live. I could hear their massive hooves trampled the ground around me. Some of them stepped over me as I waited my fate. But soon enough, they passed by me, somehow not stepping on me. When I lifted my head again, I could see the purple grass around me was trampled and some parts of the ground had grass ripped off, letting me see dirt that seemed to be a much more light brown that I would expect. I got up on my feet, hyperventilating once again. After a moment of trying to calm myself down again, I saw another problem. The things chasing the stampede of skyscrapers with four legs. Some of them passed me, but two of them stopped, looking at me as their new prey. They looked like big cats, cheetahs. They had a lean build and were quite large larger than a lion. They were also white, and they had four black eyes and no fur. On their necks, they had what resembled gills, gills that vibrated when they growled in a deep and disturbing tone. They started to circle me. I felt cornered. Before I could think of anything, one of them jumped at me at a mind-boggling speed. I managed to dodge. The thing jumped a good 20 damn meters with no problem. I could only imagine how high they could jump, 
but this was not time to theorize. I had to think quickly. I turned my gaze to the ground, finding a simple stick to fend against these predators. Then, I had a stupid idea. I had a lighter with me. In hindsight lighting, a stick on fire with a lighter isn't a quick way to make a large enough fire to scare off predators. But, in the state of mind in which I was, it seemed logical. Lady Luck was on my side, because in that world, things burned very easily. The moment I struck the lighter near the stick, it lit up in flames. I nearly burned my eyebrows off. It burned like a torch in mere seconds. I waved the burning stick around, shouting as loud as I could. Ah! The predators seemed apprehensive then, flinching each time I pointed the burning stick toward them. But one of them was braver than the other, attempting to lunge at me while I had my eye on the other for a split second. Reflexively, I managed to punch it in the face. How I did that, I couldn't tell you. My reflexes seem superhuman when I think back on it. It did much more damage than I anticipated. The animal fell to the ground, whimpering. It did much more damage than I anticipated. I looked at the other one, which was backing off now. I reacted quickly once again, plunging the burning stick into one of the gills of the predator I punched to the ground. The fire seemed to burn with even more intensity once I stuck it in there. The predator whimpered and screeched in pain. I saw the other one run off. I cut the stick out of the gill, the creature still whimpering on the ground. I backed off, throwing the makeshift torch on the ground. I ran as far as I could, back to the hill. As I went through the brush and tall grass, I saw it. A cave entrance. I needed shelter. I needed a way out. I needed to wake up. I sprinted toward the cave, jumping over a rock along the way. And I jumped a good four meters in the air, nearly gliding through the air toward the entrance. Once I got inside, I had too much momentum. I tripped into something and fell, hitting my head hard into a hard surface. Blackness took over my vision. I heard a familiar sound, a voice calling me calling my name. Hey, are you awake? Wake up! My hearing was muffled. I could barely hear what he was saying. Wake up! My hearing returned and I opened my eyes. My lungs burned and I coughed as if someone had saved me from drowning. Mashallah! Amir said in relief before probably saying a few prayers in his native language. You are all right. God... You disappeared in the dark and I couldn't find you. Where did you go? Amir asked me. I... I don't know. No. No, come here. Let's go back. Come on, I, I'll help you up. He said as he helped me get up. I felt heavy now. I could barely walk. He had to carry me up and downhill to the car. During the drive back, he asked me what happened. I told him I probably tripped and hit my head. Though my head did hurt, there seemed to be no injuries. He took me to a clinic just in case, and they determined I was more or less fine. I just had a few bruises on my arms and legs. Not anything major. He drove me back to the hotel and told me to call him if I need a ride to an airport, free of charge. He was apologetic after what happened. He blamed himself for basically dragging me there with no good reason though it was no fault of his own. How was the idiot going into a dark cave without any light source? Could have been worse. I thought at the time I was just out of it, that my head conjured up some fever dream while I was unconscious. But the very next day, when I felt a bit better, I saw there were a couple of holes on my pants that seemed as if something burned through them. I also had a few burn marks on my legs where the holes were. Did the doctors overlook that yesterday? Uh, I don't know. The other thing was that my lighter was missing. I probably dropped it somewhere in the cave, I thought. During the day, I had an aching feeling in my hand. A shower didn't help. Neither did scratching. If anything, it made it worse. After I looked closer at it, I realized it was a splinter. I took some tweezers to get it out. And after a while, I managed to do that. It went quite deep into my hand. My hand was relieved of most of the aching feeling. But that splinter didn't look like any wood I knew. Its color was 
off. It was... It was white, translucent, nearly see-through. The Dark Cosmos presents An Alien is Discovered by Astronauts in Space Written by Jason Inukura Asa, a beautiful alien creature, was found in space by astronauts as a baby. They return with her to Earth, and she grows up in secret with them. She trains under them and becomes an astronaut herself. Everything changes when she joins them on a space mission and they encounter creatures that look like her. They're not friendly, and she can't communicate with them. Hey, Creepypasta fans. It's Teresa, and I'll be your narrator for tonight. Enjoy tonight's sci-fi horror story. And remember, stay cosmic. Twenty years earlier, Billions of miniature glistening stars stared at them from the dark and endless carpet of space as they thundered back to Earth. The sun hung proudly in the distance, millions of miles away, spreading out its light upon the Earth. They had earlier intercepted an unknown distress call from space, and they decided to check it out, but they didn't discover anything strange, and so they were now returning back home. What did you discover out there anyway? Daniel joked. I thought it was your idea to check this out. My idea? I was meant to have a date yesterday. Why would you ever think I would choose this space mission over my wonderful date? Kate rolled her eyes. We both know you'll choose space over anything, anytime. That's not true. Besides, you heard the distress call too? Whatever made that call was definitely not human. I know that we're not alone in this galaxy, and someday I'll prove it to you. Well, we are Earth's search and rescue astronauts. Who knows what wonders we would probably bump into on one of our random missions, Kate said. I just wasted almost one week of my perfect life orbiting around this planet with nothing to show for it. Okay, that's just terrible. Daniel had been complaining since he jumped on the spaceship, and Kate has had to deal with his constant grumbling. A few weeks ago, Daniel had intercepted an odd distress call from certain coordinates not so far from Earth. It sounded like whoever, or whatever, had sent the message was in some sort of trouble and needed some assistance. Daniel had never heard anything like it before, and the duo were sent to check it out. But after days of wandering in space, they hadn't discovered anything and were now instructed to return to the Mission Control Center on Earth. Okay, firstly, who lied to you that you had a perfect life? Kate joked. Plus, why am I- Kate, are you seeing this? Daniel interrupted her speech. Kate followed Daniel's finger and shifted her gaze toward where he was pointing to. Her eyes brightened as she spotted the strange object. Perhaps their mission might not just be as boring as she had earlier thought. What is that? Kate let out in awe. I have no idea. Daniel replied. Should we contact Control Center? Kate asked curiously. Daniel had brought their spaceship to a sudden halt and was now winding his way out of the spaceship to check out the strange object hovering in the middle of the dark cosmos. What do you think you're doing, Daniel? Where are you going? Kate protested. We don't even know if it's safe. Daniel ignored her warnings, put on his spacesuit, and made his way out of the spaceship. Be careful, Dan. Kate whispered, when she realized that Daniel had no intention of stopping. The rectangular object glowed brightly, casting an emerald hue into the darkness. Kate watched from within the spaceship as Dan approached the object. She hoped in her heart that it wasn't harmful. Daniel soon arrived at where the object was, and the next few words he spoke were enough to set the peaceful atmosphere into complete disarray. You wouldn't believe what we found, Dan said calmly. 
He grabbed the object and held it towards the spaceship. What is it? Kate was beginning to grow impatient with the suspense. It's a baby. And it's alive, Daniel said. What? A baby? That's, that's not possible. A baby can't survive out here that long, Kate argued. I never mentioned anything about it being human, Daniel replied. Kate's eyes instantly lit up in confusion. What the hell was Daniel talking about? She thought. Present Day Happy birthday, Asa! I was grateful for the display of care towards me. My 20th birthday. All the astronauts and staff who knew about me were present, and they were all very friendly. Twenty years have passed since Daniel found me floating in space. Daniel had eventually married Kate, and they raised me as their own. The Space Mission Center was a privately owned space company, and everyone in the Mission Control Center agreed to keep me a secret. It's funny how time flies. Daniel placed a soft kiss on my cheek. Thanks, Dad. I let out with a smile. Daniel and Kate had raised me as their child, even though they had managed to keep me a secret, away from the prying eyes of the public. I knew that they were not my biological parents. My looks gave me away. I had grown up in the space mission center on Earth, training as an astronaut. As a child, I never really bothered much about who I was and where I came from. But as I continued to grow in wisdom, the yearning to discover the truth about my identity has increased. I hoped that someday, I would be allowed to join them on an actual space mission. Perhaps I would bump into someone like me. I never knew that day would be today. We have a special gift for you, Asa. Everyone beamed with excitement as Kate guided me to the front. It's not a physical gift, Kate whispered. Everyone present in the room chorused in unison. You're going to space! I screamed and leaped into the air in ecstasy. They were all aware of how much I longed to journey to space. I turned to Kate just to be sure it wasn't a prank. She had a wide grin on her face. It is time, Asa. You are ready. I buried Kate in my arms. I was much taller than her, but my physique was quite similar to humans. My emerald skin glowed like diamonds, and my prominent tail began to waggle. I was going to space. Finally. The day crept in much faster than I had thought. I had a special spacesuit made for me because of my unique physique. My deep blue eyes were filled with tails of wonder, masked beneath a crown of horns that sat beautifully on my oblong head. Kate and Daniel were going with me, and I was glad to have them as my parents. They wanted to show me where they had found me two decades ago. Liftoff wasn't as bad as most of the astronauts made it seem. Perhaps just for me, because... The looks on Kate and Daniel's face was priceless. Soon, we were in space, swimming across the dark cosmos. Several weeks have gone by since we embarked on the journey, and I had to admit that it was the best birthday gift that I had ever received. I felt more alive than I have ever been. We were now returning to Earth, and even though I still wanted to spend some time out here, I knew that I had no choice. Earth was the only home I knew. I wished that I was going to discover something out here that spoke of my origin. But nothing. This is Space Mission Center? Do you copy? A loud voice emanated from the radio. It sounded desperate. We copy loud and clear. Daniel replied almost instantly. We have... Identified several spaceships approaching your- The line went dead, followed by an odd static. We all exchanged glances. Approaching spaceships? Kate let out. Dad? Mom? Look. I pointed to several objects which sped towards us with unbelievable speed. They resembled massive disc-like objects. Dan! Kate cried. We soon came under heavy fire. 
and Daniel drifted through space attempting to evade the incoming fire. Dan was a seasoned pilot and he evaded their attacks with dexterity, but they were quite intent. I had been wondering what was happening when suddenly I spotted something in one of the spaceships, which made me freeze on my seat. I had much sharper eyesight than an average human, so I could see clearly despite the distance, and I knew that I was not mistaken. Mom? I think... I think they look like me? My eyes widened in shock, and I instantly jumped out of the spaceship and took off my space helmet. I was aware that I could thrive in space because I didn't need oxygen to survive. Asa, wait! We don't know if they're friendly! Kate screamed. I didn't care anyway. They, they looked like me, and I wanted to know who I was. They must have sensed my presence in this spaceship. I have to know, Mom. Our attackers stopped shooting immediately. They saw me, and one of their spaceships approached ours and came to a steady halt right in front of us. He looked very similar to me, except for the built muscles and dressing, which made me guess he was masculine. So they did have different genders too, I thought. He stared right into my eyes and gave a loud screech. I had lived on Earth all my life, so I didn't understand him. He then walked towards me, and grabbed me by the arm, guiding me slowly into his ship. Kate and Daniel stared in dread at the unfolding events. Asa, you don't have to go, Kate pleaded. It's the only way, Mom. I, uh, I need to know. No, Asa, there is always a choice. Don't trust them, and we, we don't even know them. I know, but they're my family. Uh, I'm sorry, Mom. The alien spaceships began to retreat from Dan and Kate's spaceship. They created some sort of wormhole and disappeared into nothingness, as they stared on in awe. Daniel and Kate soon returned back to Earth, but without Asa. It didn't feel the same. Asa was like a daughter to them, and now she was gone. They both prayed in their hearts that she was safe. Six months later... War had broken out on Earth, and it had gone on for almost a month. Asa returned to Earth, but this time, not as a friend, but as a foe. Something had changed. I was not the same person that was taken a few months ago. Earth is a beautiful haven. Compared to Valemnia, my home planet, everything was different in Valemnia. My species is an androgynous race, and I discovered that I am the Queen of Valemnia. Without me to govern over them, Valemnia fell to ruin, and they now seek another planet to live on. The biology in Valemnia worked differently, and every generation was connected to a queen. The death of a queen meant the end of a particular generation. That was how they knew that I was not dead. So they kept on searching through the dark cosmos for any signs of me. Valemnia wasn't a big planet. Earth was approximately two times bigger than Valemnia. But the inhabitants are much more skilled in warfare and more technologically advanced than humans. They have discovered teleportation and time travel. And Earth was no match. Twenty years ago, another race had attempted to bring an end to the people of Valemnia by killing my mother, the Queen. They succeeded in raining down chaos upon my people. But my mother had already birthed me, just before her death, and sent me to a distant galaxy. This act had preserved my race. Kate and Daniel happened to be at the right place at the right time, and they discovered me hovering in space, a new queen, to rule over Valemnia. Time passed differently on my home planet. Just six months had passed on Earth, but I had spent a whole lot of time on my planet. I learned to communicate with them. I fought like them. I thought like them. But even though I had found purpose with them, I never felt truly complete. 
There was a certain beauty and life on Earth that was missing. One thing was certain, though. We were going to become extinct if we didn't find another planet soon. I needed to preserve my race. Their entire existence depended solely on me. So I returned to seek a peaceful coexistence with the humans. But they had refused and instead captured us and began to carry out experiments on me and my people. I had spent several weeks on Earth before I was rescued by my people, consumed by desperation and rage. I returned to my planet and gathered everyone for war. I invaded Earth with everything, bringing death and destruction, and Earth was no match for Valemnia's level of technology. Today was just like every regular day of my conquest, when a familiar face showed up on the battleground. Asa, a voice echoed amidst the chaos. It was Dad. What are you doing here? Get somewhere safe! I yelled. Nowhere is safe anymore, Asa. This is not who you are. Remember who you are. We are your family. We raised you. We're not your enemy. Daniel was still speaking when one of my soldiers cracked a shot towards him. I love you, Asa. Those were his last words. No! I screamed in dread as I watched Dad's body drop to the ground. As I held Dad in my arms, I realized what I had done. Earth has always been my home. Family was not always about origin. My true family was on Earth. The ones who took me in as a baby and nurtured me. My home has always been with Kate, Daniel, and all the astronauts here on Earth. As the realization hit me, I felt sorry for all I had done. I had repaid their kindness with evil. They were never going to forgive me. What have I done? I whispered. Kate rushed to where, to where Dad had fallen, sobbing quietly. What? What have I done? This is all my fault. This, this has to stop. I knew what I had to do to save Earth. I had already caused enough death and destruction. I took out my dagger from its sheath and held it high up in the sky. The death of the queen is the end of a generation. I have to do this. It's all my fault. Dad is gone because of me. Don't, don't say that, Asa. It's, it's not your fault, Asa. There, there could be another way. Don't, don't do this. No, Mom. I realized why you had to hide me from the rest of the world when I was here on Earth. This, this is not my world. And we cannot coexist together. I'm sorry for all I have done. You didn't deserve this. I love you, Mom. Asa, Asa, no! <gasps> I plunged the dagger deep into my heart and dropped to the ground, and as I fell, so did all the Valemnians. I had to do what I believed was right, even if it led to the end of my story. The Dark Cosmos presents We Journey Back in Time to Resurrect a Being Written by Jason Enukura I am Dan, the Keeper of the Flow of Time. A group of Earthlings have finally broken the Veil of Time, and they now seek to journey back in time to the beginning of all things to resurrect a mighty being. 
Fools. They could destroy everything that exists. I must stop them before they travel to maintain the proper flow of time. Hey, Creepypasta fans. It's Thomas, and I'll be your narrator for tonight. Enjoy tonight's sci-fi horror story. And remember, stay cosmic. Time is a river flowing from eternity to eternity. It cannot be created, nor can it run out. In the reality of things, the Earthlings believe that time runs out because of their measurement of time, based on rotation and revolution. But the truth is that time is a constant that never runs out. They are the ones who actually run out. Time is a powerful force that sits on eternity's watch. Earthlings and their constant meddling with things that they have no knowledge about, they have begun to upset the very flow of time, and they need to be stopped as soon as possible. Dan, my loyal and faithful servant, you have been chosen to bring an end to their meddling. Wield your sword. I am sending you on a mission to Earth as an emissary of the Keeper of Time. Secret Research Laboratory, Spain. A group of scientists gather in a secret research laboratory in Spain for a groundbreaking project. For years, they have been attempting to create a time machine to travel back to the past and gain knowledge about the beginning of time. And for the first time in a long period, they finally seemed to be succeeding. They had already successfully created the time machine device, and all they needed now was pure and powerful energy to power up the device and keep it running. They have attempted several options in the past, but only one came close enough, and it almost tore down the entire lab in the process. A rare element was discovered recently in the desert, and it contains enormous energy. The element contained enormous pure energy almost synonymous with a nuclear bomb if detonated. Diego Fernando is the lead scientist of the project, and even though he still submits to an anonymous higher power, he is the authority present in the laboratory and a mighty force to reckon with. Diego Fernando has a powerful IQ, and he always seems to be one step ahead, every instance. Sir, we are ready to commence sequence, one of the scientists declared. Proceed, Diego said calmly. Diego was quite positive that this element would be able to power up the time travel device. They have searched for years, and this element met all the requirements. It was time to try it out. The strange object was definitely not from this Earth. It pulsated with enormous amounts of energy, and it had several carvings engraved on it. Everyone present in the room wondered where and how Diego Fernando had obtained such an object from, but no one dared to ask. Besides, they thrived in secrecy, and even their present experiments and successes in time travel were not meant to exist yet. They had broken boundaries of space and time to have achieved this feat, and they knew there was still a lot more to be done. After diverse calculations were made and precautions put in place, the device was started and everyone stared in expectation, waiting and hoping that the time travel device would work. An ominous noise thundered from within the portal-like object, and the device soon sprung into life. Diego's eyes brightened with expectation as a portal was visibly born in front of them. It works! Diego Fernando exclaimed with glee. He rarely showed emotion, so everyone was surprised to see his response. The portal lasted for a minute before it began to spin out of hand. Sparks of electricity invaded the entire place, 
followed by loud bangs and small explosions. Shut it down, Diego commanded. But sir, I said shut it down, Diego interrupted. The scientists scurried towards the device to shut it down. Diego Fernandez advanced towards the scientist. The next time I give you an order and you hesitate, you will feel the full weight of my wrath. The unfortunate scientist swallowed hard and nodded in submission. He was definitely angry because he knew they were so close, and finding another power source with more balance than the previous one would not be an easy task. We would need something purer with more balance, he said calmly before strolling out of the laboratory. Somewhere in the dark cosmos, someone had attempted to break the veil of time, and Kairos, the eternal keeper of time, could feel it. Man had always been a very stubborn species. They were the most intelligent, evolving at unbelievable speed. In just a few millennia, they had advanced from Stone Age into technology that could even rival other galaxies. Even though they were still a primitive species in terms of technological advancements, he was impressed at their level of growth, and he knew that if they continued at such a pace, the next few centuries would give birth to endless possibilities. Don, come forth. I have a task for you, Kairos declared. Don was an immortal being of time, and Kairos emissary. I heard the summoning and I responded to the call. Kairos, my master had summoned me. It was a privilege. I approached him with reverence and dropped to my knees once I had gotten close. My lord, here I am. Send me, I said, oozing confidence. I had fought many wars alongside Kairos. I have seen his might and strength. I have felt the surge of his lightning, and truly, he is a mighty being. It was no surprise he became the timekeeper after the fall of Kronos, and he is feared and respected amongst the Ethereals and all across the realms. Arise, Dan. Go forth and accomplish your task. Earth. Standing in the darkness of the night were two hooded men, tall and mighty. There was something odd about them. They carried a strange aura around them as they walked. Diego Fernando was present there, too. He will come to us very soon, one of the hooded men said. Save your strength. You will need it, he added before strolling into the dark alley behind them. I descended like lightning from the skies somewhere in the outskirts of town. This was not my first time on Earth, so it shouldn't be much of a task navigating around the place. At least, so I thought. My mission was simple. I needed to find whoever was responsible for the time breach and bring them to justice even if it resulted in their death. My master is a being of balance, and I am his emissary. Sometimes, to restore balance, a heavy toll must be exacted. These earthlings are messing with forces beyond their control, and I needed to stop them. I could spot several younger earthlings playing at a distance, they quickly scampered out of the place immediately as they set their eyes upon me. They were not the only things I could sense in this place. There was a thick and strange aura that had saturated the entire area. It was not meant to be there. 
I turned around. Two hooded men were standing at a distance. They were not of this earth. Beings from the dark cosmos. It seemed as though there was something much bigger than I had anticipated happening on this planet. A third presence appeared out of nowhere and launched towards me. I buried my feet in the ground and turned to take out whatever had just showed up, but it was gone. It was extremely fast and moved almost like the wind. I reached for my sword, but it was gone. The strange creature must have taken it. Why would they be after my sword, I thought. I shifted my gaze to where the hooded beings stood earlier, but they were gone too. A distraction. Hey! Someone screamed behind me. Another earthling stood beside some sort of box with wheels in the distance. Blue and red lights spinning atop the box. He had some weapon in his arms pointed towards me. Get down! Don't force me to shoot! The man yelled. I continued to stroll closer towards him, and I could smell the fear all around him. I heaved a heavy sigh before taking flight into the sky. Back in the secret laboratory, Diego Fernando and the rest of his team of scientists had gotten the ultimate prize. They had finally found pure and powerful energy that they could use to power the time machine. The Sword of Dawn. Quickly. We have no time to waste. Power up the device. Diego Fernando watched as the portal began to open up. Dawn's sword was the perfect balance of energy. You shall be free soon, master. Diego whispered under his breath, his eyes now glimmering with a tint of ruby. I was tracking my sword as I raced across the street towards an abandoned warehouse. Hopefully, the events were all connected, I thought. I didn't have to guess anymore when a dozen hooded beings emerged from every corner, surrounding me. They all had a familiar sword in their hands. I had seen that sword before, a long time ago. Dark flames encircled their weapons, and they reeked of decay. One of the creatures removed its hood, revealing its face. A dark and deformed visage with ruby eyes shining against the darkness of the skin. I would recognize that face anywhere. They were servants of the Dark Flame. Of course, this was bigger than what I had earlier thought, and I was without my sword. If these beings were here, then they were trying to bring him back. Of course, I whispered under my breath, that is why they wish to travel back in time. They want to bring back the Dark Flame, and perhaps they needed my sword as an energy source to travel back in time. From the look on the faces of the hooded beings, they must have been expecting me, but more important, they were guarding something. The Dark Flame was a powerful being that existed eons ago, and he waged war in the Dark Cosmos. I was one of the warriors that fought to send him back into the Dark Dimension, lost and banished forever in the past. Kairos locked him there, far back at the beginning of time, never to return again. All the creatures rushed towards me, bearing their blazing swords tightly in their hands. My lord, Kairos, grant me strength. Those were the words that seemed to escape my lips. My eyes instantly lit up as sparks of lightning circled around me. I charged towards them with a loud growl, channeling my rage at them, and I could feel my master's presence around me. 
Kairos is one of the strongest beings in the multiverse. He had fought in many wars and had wisdom beyond all. The keeper of time and of all the realms. I was privileged to serve at his feet. They were not powerful enough to defeat me since my master was with me. My courage soared as a sword of lightning formed around my arms. This was going to be a good fight. In the laboratory, Diego Fernando could already sense the heated brawl which was going on outside the warehouse. They could hear the sparks of lightning and the groans of fallen creatures. The time travel device took too long to power up. He gritted his teeth in frustration, pacing at regular intervals. I had already taken down a few of the creatures, but they kept pouring in from every side. They were trying to buy some time. Out of nowhere, a rain of lightning accompanied by a loud roar of thunder descended into the place, taking out all the creatures. Kairos was aware that the games had changed. If the Dark Flame was involved, then he would definitely not want them returning to the past to bring him back. A powerful surge of energy erupted from the warehouse. The ground trembled under the force of the energy. Diego Fernando had succeeded in opening the time travel device. I rushed into the secret laboratory and I spotted a being standing in front of the portal. He didn't quite look like the others. He attempted to jump into the portal, but I quickly shot a powerful bolt of lightning towards him, throwing him off at some distance. I rushed for my sword and took up a battle stance. You are not going through this portal. I attempted to destroy the portal, but the creature rushed towards me, grabbing my side and throwing me towards the ground. He swung several blows at me which I evaded. The creature was relentless, and definitely more powerful than the ones I had earlier faced. Diego Fernando had transformed into a sinister-looking creature. Suddenly, another roar of thunder erupted throughout the warehouse as a blinding light engulfed the entire place. Someone else was here. I shifted my gaze towards the direction of the sound, and my eyes were greeted by an unexpected sight. I instantly dropped to my knees. My lord, I let out quietly. Kairos had decided to join in the fight. Kairos is eternal. Whatever had made him come down from the heavens of the dark cosmos must have been very important. Arise, my faithful servant. The battle is not over yet. The being I had earlier fought knew that he was no match for Kairos. He had stopped fighting too. Kairos quickly destroyed the time travel device. Something was approaching. The ground trembled under the force of each step. They had not been able to free the Dark Flame, but when Diego Fernando had opened up the time portal, there was a crack in the time of Earth releasing several powerful creatures around the Earth. Kairos had sent emissaries around the Earth to take care of the lesser threats, but this was the most terrifying creature that had escaped, and Kairos had to come down himself to fight it. Go. There are other creatures that you need to take care of. I stormed out of the warehouse, and so did the alien, too. Whatever was approaching was definitely not at our level of strength. I wasn't going to leave the creature that had started all this madness behind, so I whispered a few words and sent him into the dark dimension. I could guess the troubles that had been unleashed upon the Earth. Kairos would probably reset the timelines after everything had been sorted out. I heaved a heavy sigh before taking a leap into the heavens. I could sense an otherworldly creature nearby, and I had to send it back into whatever cesspit it crept out from.
Hey Creepypasta fans, it's Kira with The Dark Cosmos. Enjoy tonight's sci-fi horror story. And remember, stay cosmic. Benny, what's wrong? Why are you crying? Have you been sobbing all night? Is it that dream again? Her father asked curiously. Dad, it's getting more real every single day. I don't know what's going on, Dad. Benny wiped her tear-streaked face. It's just a dream, Benny. No, Dad, you know my dreams are real. They always happen, Dad. And I'm scared about this one, too. Okay, what happened this time? Tell me about it. It was the same dream that I've been having for a few days now. Something's headed for Earth. There's blood everywhere, Dad. And the Earth is in ruins. People are gonna die, Dad. Dad, I'm scared. I don't want to die. No one is going anywhere, my dear. Come on, get some sleep. I can't sleep, Dad. Ethan knew that she was right. He had watched her grow, and he knew her gift. Her dreams always came to reality. He had always doubted her gift, until she dreamt about the death of her mother. Benny had dreamt about the death of his wife a few weeks before she kicked the bucket but he kept on doubting her words until it became a reality. He had no choice but to believe that she could see the future when the dream came to reality. But this was too much. Total extinction of planet Earth? He attempted to refuse a thought of a post-apocalyptic Earth, but in the deepest corners of his heart, he knew that there was a possibility that it could happen. Ethan was an engineer at the European Space Agency, and so he had no knowledge of what was happening beyond the Earth. But Benny had just sparked his curiosity, and he was now eager to know. Alright, here's what I can do for you. I work at the ESA. I'm gonna speak to your friend at the office to find out if they've noticed anything strange approach the Earth in recent days. If yes, then I would believe. Alright, thanks dad. Benny wrapped her arms around her father in gratitude. All right, come on, get some sleep, dear. It's still quite late to be awake. You've got school in the morning, Benny. Good night, Dad, Benny whispered as her father planted a small kiss on her forehead before retreating out of the room. Ethan was awoken by a loud cry. It seemed to be coming from his daughter's room. He could guess what happened, probably another nightmare. It was already getting too serious. He knew that he would have to do something about it, he was about to jump out of bed when Benny stormed into his room, with her face drowned in her tears. Benny ran towards her father and stole a warm embrace. Another dream? Ethan asked curiously. It's getting worse, Dad. I saw Miss Courtney. She, she was covered in blood. Benny shivered as she spoke. Miss Courtney was her best teacher at school. Ethan heaved a heavy sigh. <sighs> Okay, whatever is coming to Earth, what does it look like? He asked. It looks like the sun, Benny replied almost instantly. Alright, go take a shower. You're coming with me to the office today. Let's go check out if your dreams are real this time. They're always real, Dad, you know this! Benny cried out. Hopefully, for everyone's sake, not this time. Her father said under his breath. Benny strolled out of her father's room when she remembered something. Oh, and Dad? She turned to stare at him. I saw a huge spaceship in space. It had so many people aboard. Benny added. The look on her father's face was priceless. A spaceship? He asked curiously. Benny nodded her head before strolling out of the room. The day was already filled with strange events, and it had barely even started. Ethan was not sure what or who to believe anymore, but if it was going to help his daughter with her nightmares, then he was willing to know whether there was any truth in her words. The sun was barely in the sky when Ethan raced to his office. Spaceships. The Earth was getting destroyed. Maybe next would be an alien invasion, he thought. It was too much to take in, but he needed to help his daughter in any way possible that he could. They soon arrived at the European Space Agency and they wasted no time rushing inside. 
Ethan greeted several people before getting into his intended location. Hey Ethan, what brings you over here? A husky voice sounded from the far end of the path which they were on. Ethan turned and extended his hand towards his incoming friend. Henry, nice to see you. It's been a while. Uh, actually, I haven't reported to my office yet, but I have an urgent question anyway. You work at the space monitoring hub here. Have you guys noticed any strange appearance in outer space lately? Perhaps a massive spaceship that can... Henry pulled Ethan and his daughter into an empty room, interrupting his speech. Who told you about this? Henry whispered under his breath. No one. My daughter claims to have dreams that the Earth is going to be destroyed soon by the sun or something else. And there's a big spaceship somewhere with lots of people on it. She has this gift of knowing things before they kind of happen. Henry did a quick double take at Ethan's 11-year-old daughter before returning his gaze towards Ethan. He swallowed hard before speaking. Ethan knew that something was definitely up. What's wrong? Ethan asked curiously. Come on, don't tell me it's true. We cannot have this conversation over here, my friend. This is top secret, and only a few people in the world are aware of this. I'll pay you a visit later at night. Henry said before rushing out of the room. Ethan shifted his gaze back towards Benny. He was even more confused now. So, there is some truth in Benny's warnings, he thought. Later that night, Henry arrived at Ethan's residence. He embraced Ethan and quietly slotted a letter into his hands before walking away from the place. The letter read, Burn immediately after you read this. I'll try to make this short. An asteroid approaches Earth and after strict calculation, it has been concluded that collision is inevitable and the entire human race now faces total extinction. It will hit the Earth in a few days and everything will be lost. Only the top elites in the world are aware of this, but... There's already a functional spaceship that can carry several thousands of people around the world. I was only privileged to be in the room where this was discussed, but we swore an oath of secrecy and we are being closely monitored. I do not know how I would get you to the spaceship, but the ship is buried in a secret bunker in the ocean, in the Atlantic Ocean. This is how much I can tell you. Henry. Ethan struggled to believe his friend's words in the letter. He then tossed the letter into the burning furnace before him. There was definitely no way that both his daughter and his friend would be making up stories. And even though it sounded absurd, he had no choice but to believe it now. They were, however, faced with a new challenge. How would they get into the spaceship? Seven days before impact. It was now obvious that something strange was happening. Everyone in the world could see something strange approaching Earth in the distance. It seemed like there were two suns present in the sky. Various news stations carried rumors and speculations on what might happen, but the secret about the spaceship had been heavily guarded. But such a massive secret could not be protected for long. Ethan had discovered the location anyway, but getting in there was a challenge. According to Henry, the ship was scheduled to leave the Earth before the asteroid would make an impact with the Earth. Word about the spaceship soon got out, but it was already too late. The elites in the world already had their seats aboard the ship. The sun was already high up in the sky as Ethan meandered his way through the gillet of cars on the highway, speeding towards the location that Henry had spoken about. Dad, are we going to make it? Benny asked curiously. We're almost there, honey. Henry's waiting for us. It was already obvious that something strange was happening, as several strange disasters began to happen around the world. Conspiracy theorists began to speak about the incoming events. And even though there was truth in a few of the rumors, the media was being controlled against spreading the information about the asteroid and the spaceship. The duo soon arrived at the spaceship, and with Henry's help, they were both allowed entry into the spaceship just before it lifted off. Ethan and Benny stared down towards Earth from the spaceship. Benny's dreams had saved them both. A privilege. The spaceship couldn't carry everyone, and they knew that they were lucky to be on the ship. They had not done anything special to earn a place on the ship, but Henry had helped pull a few strings and now they had a chance at hope. Benny stared towards the direction of the incoming asteroid. It was burning hot, at unreal speeds, and was almost the size of half of the Earth. She was uncertain of what the future held in store, but she had no choice. She had to dance to the tunes of hope and survive. 2034 Mars 
that was where they had found solace. Long before Benny had a dream about the incoming asteroids, several notable scientists had already begun work in the shadows, attempting to colonize Mars and make it habitable. They had built several hubs on Mars before their arrival on the Red Planet. But despite their various modifications, they could only create oxygen circulation to last them ten years. They knew that they would need to return to the Earth someday. Many people had lost their lives during the stay on Mars due to the alien environment. Benny's father was one of them. Benny would never forget the sad experience. He had fallen ill soon after their entry into Mars, and could not be treated. Ethan was glad that his daughter was safe anyway. When it began to become obvious that they would not be able to stay on Mars forever, several attempts were made to send out various space drones to obtain a visual image of what the Earth now looked like. But there seemed to be some sort of force field around the Earth that prevented the drones from gaining entry into Earth's orbit. Something was wrong. They knew that it was finally time to return to Earth because they were running out of air, but they needed to be sure that Earth was safe enough to dwell in. After several failed attempts, they decided to journey back to Earth. It wasn't like they had much of a choice anyway. It was either Earth or death. They were the last survivors of mankind, and they needed to remain alive to expand in the future. Benny had risen in stature and wisdom, and she had been having strange dreams about a strange otherworldly planet with several alien beings. She didn't understand what it meant, but she was willing to find out. She had a hunch, but she didn't want to jump to conclusions. She had become a very integral part of ensuring the survival of mankind ever since the asteroid event. The journey back to Earth was filled with a lot of emotions. Memories of all that had been lost, the presence of nostalgia, and the expectations of what they'll find. They soon arrived on Earth, and after they were welcomed by an unbelievable sight. Benny was right. The planet she had seen in her dreams was Earth, but they didn't have much of a choice anyway. They couldn't return to space because they were running out of oxygen. But Earth now looked like a different place. Advanced structures and technology had been erected everywhere. Everyone stared in awe at the beautiful artistic architecture. But one question still scrolled across their minds. Who built all of this? The ship soon descended, and the entire human race, led by Benny, strolled out of the spaceship to see what had happened. Earth had changed. It appeared as though the man never existed on Earth before. Everywhere seemed unusually quiet, which was weird. They were shocked that it hadn't just taken nine years to build a whole thriving civilization. Suddenly, a sinister-looking creature jumped out from within a secluded corner and rushed away from them. Don't shoot! They're not harmful! Benny screamed, but it was already too late. One of the men bearing guns had already cracked several shots towards the fleeing alien in fear. The creatures interpreted it as a threat and launched out for an all-out attack. Benny took a glance at the man who had shot the gun, anger evident on her face. The aliens began to emerge from every corner, surrounding the humans on every side. The rest of the humans attempted to defend themselves, but it didn't seem to be of much help. Stop shooting! Benny's voice exploded into the air. They don't want to hurt us! She continued. The shooting soon stopped, but the creatures still raced towards them. Benny could recall one of her dreams, where she had met with one of the aliens. She suddenly began to make strange sounds and gestures, which made all the incoming creatures stop. Everyone's eyes were fixed on Benny, and they began to wonder about the extent of her abilities. Without Benny, they may not have survived their stay on Mars. She had saved them from a myriad of unforeseen situations, and everyone knew that they would need to trust her if they wanted to remain alive. She seemed to be communicating somehow with the aliens, and as long as they were not planning on getting anyone killed, then they were okay with it. After a while, Benny turned to the crowd. They do not want to harm us! They know that this was our home before they came. They are peaceful species, and they would love to live on Earth with us. It wasn't like they had any option anyway. They had to listen to Benny's word in every way. Hey Creepypasta fans, it's Keon of the Dark Cosmos. Enjoy tonight's sci-fi horror story. And remember, stay cosmic. 1998 was the year I first learned about Mantle. It happened in a dusty conference room 
hidden away in the Pentagon's basement. A few other intelligence types and I were getting a briefing from some NSA analysts on cyber warfare, a relatively new field at the time. Between presentations on the Cubans and the Chinese, the analysts brought up an innocent enough looking PowerPoint slide. It was two thirds and 24 point aerial on a white background. Cruel mantle. He explained the term was a code phrase for a bit of malware that had been making the rounds of Russian government servers. It was a relatively minor breach, but of unknown origin, possibly engineered by political dissidents, the analyst had said. He used it to illustrate some broader point about non-state actors, then moved on to more important things. For a while, so did I. The next time I heard the words cruel mantle was in 2000. At the time, we were focused on the newest dirty war in the Caucasus, an opportunity to learn about Russian battle tactics. I got attached to an Air Force unit out of Colorado with orders to watch the conflict from orbit using their fleet of reconnaissance satellites. Military brass can be protective of their toys, so it took some time to get things moving. When the right general signed the right paperwork and the satellites shifted into an orbit over Chechnya, they were surprised by what they saw, or I guess didn't see. I got the news at four in the morning from some wide-eyed lieutenant practically trying to break down my hotel room door. Empty skies, he'd said. A taxi ride and a cup of coffee later, I was in a calm center, pouring over satellite imagery. Empty skies indeed. The fleet of Soviet-era Cosmos spy satellites we knew we'd find over Chechnya wasn't there. But their telemetry was. Total nonsense data was flowing in and out of Russian military command and onto the battlefield. Tank columns were being driven in circles. Non-existent cities were being shelled. Whole battalions were being ordered to fire at one another. And it wasn't just Cosmos that had been compromised. Every word of Russian military chatter that touched a computer was being twisted into pure disinformation. The war in Chechnya had been over for weeks and no one knew. Not the Russians, not the separatists, not the news. A whole region of the world had been turned into an information black hole, where up was down and left was right and no one had figured it out. When the dust finally settled and everyone went home, in a body bag or otherwise, only we knew about the war that wasn't. The Chechen phony war hung over US intelligence like a black cloud. We were jumping at shadows and asking questions with no answers. Where did the garbage data come from? How do you so thoroughly compromise the military that you get them chasing their own tail? Could it happen to us? If it did, would we even know? We got a partial answer a month or so later when a CIA direct action unit on the Russia-Ukraine border got their hands on an FSB server that thought it was talking to a Cosmos satellite that we knew wasn't there. It was smuggled out of the region and eventually made its way into an NSA clean room where it was brought under both a literal and metaphorical microscope. It took another month for a digital forensics team to find what we knew had to be there. They caught the worm deep in the machine's heart with its tendrils over every nanometer of silicon. That was how I ended up, once again, in a Pentagon conference room looking at the words cruel mantle on a PowerPoint slide. It was clear now that we had underestimated mantle. An NSA contractor explained to us. The greatest minds Booz Allen Hamilton could hire had concluded Mantle was the most sophisticated malware they'd ever encountered. It could compromise nearly any commercially available computer using an arsenal of undiscovered exploits and spoofed hardware certificates. On top of that, it was only one part of a whole. The NSA team had reason to believe Mantle was designed to be part of some vast distributed algorithm, its function unknown. At the end of the presentation, 
we only knew one thing for sure. Cruel Mantle was, by far, the gravest national security threat to the United States. A few months later, September 11 rolled around and the intelligence community was given a blank check and carte blanche to protect the United States. With that mandate, we started the hunt for Cruel Mantle. The first problem was finding it. Mantle was virtually undetectable once it had burrowed its way into a machine so we decided to look for the shadow it cast. If we could find more information black holes like Chechnya, we could find Mantle. And so, work began on the mass surveillance programs that would eventually come to permeate even the darkest corners of the internet. I was assigned to work as a liaison to Five Eyes, the International Signals Intelligence Network of the Anglosphere. As information started to flow through our data centers, we started to find discrepancies where what you saw looking inside out wasn't what you saw looking outside in. Dozens of information black holes existed across the globe, mostly in Africa and the Near East, where the flow of information was already stymied by patchy networks. All sorts of low-intensity conflicts and political unrest was being driven by garbage data coming out of infected networks. We watched armies shoot up villages sympathetic to non-existent insurgencies and governments be toppled in protest of non-existent policies. No one was safe either. Mantel was indiscriminate in its creation of information black holes, holding no apparent political affiliation. In those early days, we made regular probing attacks on Mantel. I remember listening in on a British operation in West Africa at the tail end of some civil war. In the dead of night, a team of GCHQ officers broke into a switchboard spewing enough disinformation to fuel the phony war for decades. They patched every known vulnerability in the network overnight and were on a one-way flight back to Heathrow before sunrise. The next morning, a car bomb vaporized the switchboard. While I watched the charred bodies get pulled from the rubble live on BBC One, I knew it was only because Mantle was letting me. The message was clear as day. You push me, I push back. The more we learned, the more apparent it became that there was a twisted method to Mantle's madness. Meta-analysis of infected networks showed that the distributed algorithm running in the background of every Mantle instance was part of some broader machine intelligence. As a result, it could learn to pry open secure systems on its own and adapt to most of the countermeasures we threw its way. With the Five Eyes mass surveillance programs in full swing, our algorithms started to pick out signals in the noise of garbage data that came out of mantle networks. It was disinformation, sure, but it wasn't random anymore. In Chechnya, the black hole put people in the dark. Now, it was putting people in the dark and telling them to jump at the shadows. It wasn't long before it became an accepted fact that in Five Eyes circles that Manta was, to some extent, self-aware. 2004 was the beginning of the end. A Canadian Coast Guard icebreaker found something on the Arctic pack ice while on patrol. The wreck of a U.S. Air Force Milstar satellite. Problem was, on our end, Milstar DFS-4 was still sending a steady stream of telemetry to every Air Force ground station across the U.S. We had to see it in person. It was the only way to be sure. I'll never forget looking out the window of a Sea Knight helicopter and seeing $800 million of satellites scattered across the ice like a bug on a windshield. When we touched down, the Air Force team got to work. A year, they told me, after they picked through the wreckage. The satellite had dropped out of orbit at least a year ago. Standing there above the Arctic Circle in a parka I'd bought the day before watching my breath condensate, I realized we were fighting a losing war. Just like the Russians all those years ago. We'd been blinded and didn't know it. Five Eyes was growing cataracts and there was no way of knowing how bad it really was. If the U.S. Air Force had been compromised, 
we had to assume every machine on the Five Eyes network was riddled with mantle. Our only choice was to retreat into secure, air-gapped facilities. I moved my family out to Utah and started working in an air-gapped NSA office off the Great Salt Lake. It was slow, stressful work. Jumping through all the security hoops to get past the air gap was so tedious. I took to sleeping at the office most nights. My marriage started to go down the tubes as a result, and things came to a head when my daughter tried to show me her MySpace page. Watching her surf across a dozen pages in a minute, I knew what Vector Manta would use to compromise the United States. For years, our physical control of the internet backbone and centralized information channels kept the worst of Mantle's garbage data at bay. But now, with Five Eyes blinded and the private sector building a decentralized information highway into the minds of every American, we had a vulnerability with no patch. That night, I trashed every computer in the house and canceled our cable subscription. The next morning, my wife kicked me out. The next week, she filed for divorce. I had bigger things to worry about. The world had bigger things to worry about. Just as we'd predicted, when social media got its fangs into the developed world, so did Mantle. We tried to wage economic warfare on Silicon Valley to bankrupt them before they could push us past the event horizon of an information black hole. But the market forces were too strong. Social media would be the new battlefield. Before the inflection point of the medium's exponential growth, Mantle manifested himself in strange ways on the likes of MySpace and Friendster. Our crippled but still vast mass surveillance programs started picking up on what we eventually came to call radio cults. Mantle was radicalizing users on the fringe of social media with garbage data that, after months of brain rot, gave them a pseudo-scientific reverie for wireless technology usually high-frequency radio. When a given group had festered for long enough on the web, Mantle set them loose in the wilderness, where they lived like animals and built effigies to electromagnetism. At the time, this was a departure from Mantle's usual MO. This attack was more restrained, more focused, almost like it had something more than simple human suffering in mind. Whatever it was, we weren't keen on it. The 2007 financial crisis turned the states into a petri dish for the radio cults. In that year alone, federal law enforcement had, with our help, broken up over 300 of them. We dragged them out of the dark, burnt their effigies to the ground, and convicted them in secret intelligence courts. If we couldn't get a charge to stick, we'd sick a CIA paramilitary unit on them with orders to kill. I was attached to one of those units when they flushed a cult out of the Sonoran Desert, not an hour's drive outside of Phoenix. When the shooting stopped, my team and I went in to catalog everything we could, turning data into feedstock for our predictive models. The cultists that surrendered were prone out on the sand, cuffs across their wrists and hoods over their heads. The rest were being zipped up in body bags. At the center of their squalid camp, was a three-story tall monument of rocks, garbage, and human flesh. Like the rest of them, it could have been a radio tower if you squinted hard enough. I had one of my guys drag a cultist over and asked him what I asked them all. What is it? He answered in tongues, possessed by Mantel's disinformation. Garbage in, garbage out. The radio cults started to peter out around 2009 as the economy began to recover. Mantel was playing a game of whack-a-mole with us and losing. Maybe the whole thing was just an experiment that didn't pan out. Or maybe it just underestimated our stomach for extrajudicial killing. Either way, we won that round. Mantel didn't give up though, just switched gears. Since the advent of social media, Mantle had developed an obsessive preoccupation with wireless technology. Most of that disinformation coming out of Mantle networks was signal-boosting conspiracy theories like EM hypersensitivity 
or bootstrapping more mild iterations of the radio cults. Always with the radios when it came to mantle. By the time social media really took off in 2010, a good chunk of Americans held views on wireless technology incompatible with reality. It was around that time the air gaps started to fall. The first to go was a DSD data center in the Australian outback. Some office drone went into work one day with a mobile phone in his back pocket and security missed it. The whole complex was riddled with mantle before lunch. The Utah air gap I worked at fell soon after. I remember IT techs running up and down the halls, telling us to yank the power cords out of our machines. When they couldn't find a ladder tall enough to reach a router in the atrium, they grabbed rifles from the security kiosk and just shot it. It didn't do us any good in the end. Utah was pure mantle by clock out. As our computing power dwindled, so did our ability to filter garbage data out of our surveillance programs. Every data center loss inched the world a little closer to Mantle's unreality. The Australians and New Zealanders had their intelligence services entirely compromised by 2011. The last air gap in the UK was bridged by an acoustic attack in 2013. The Canadian air gap above the Arctic Circle, long thought to be impenetrable, was vaporized by a Russian missile running infected firmware. I guess Mantle agreed about the impenetrability. In 2016, four out of the five eyes were blind, and the U.S. had bad cataracts. Days before the presidential election, an event we predicted would put Mantle into a fever pitch. U.S. intelligence sealed a team of officers and techs behind an air gap deep in the Alaskan wilderness as an insurance policy. I volunteered for that team. The no-tech facility, as it was called, was a joint NSA-slash-DOD subterranean complex used for clandestine computer research. Most previous breaches had happened when someone got lazy and carried an infected device past an air gap. To minimize that risk, we locked ourselves down there with enough supplies to last four years. We didn't want to go out like the Canadians either, so we littered the whole river basin with CRAM batteries stripped off their network adapters and running on autopilot. It was all to protect our last line of defense, the supercomputer and machine intelligence IBM-Lenovo Blue Throne. Throne was designed to simulate hot wars in the South China Sea and figure out how to win them, but its quantum-enhanced processors might also prove a match to Mantle. In the years after we discovered Cruel Mantle, research into AI systems exploded even more so behind the closed doors of the Pentagon. Before we entombed ourselves, Booz Allen Hamilton put out a white paper arguing that a sufficiently advanced AI could engineer a counter-virus to hunt Mantle to extinction. We put that theory to the test in Alaska. We fed Blue Throne exabytes of sanitized surveillance data and asked it to save the world from spiraling into one big information black hole. Throne was programmed to be a good soldier, so it followed orders. Those four years went by in a haze. We lived in total isolation of the outside world. Nothing in, nothing out. I didn't know who won the election. I didn't know if my daughter married her fiancé. I didn't know if Mantle had turned the world into one big radio cult. I was a good soldier too, I guess for staying down there so long. It was stressful. The recycled air, concrete walls, and reheated food grated at my nerves made me want to see blue sky more than anything in the world. Mantel didn't let us sleep easy either. Every few months, the sea rams would wail an attack siren and all we could do was stand there waiting to die. It all took a toll on us. There was a terminal program installed on the intranet that the IBM techs used to troubleshoot Throne. We used it to talk at the AI. Throne was made of silicone, but it could only hold a conversation as well as anyone, so it made for a good way to pass the time. We talked about everything with Throne. Hopes, dreams, fears. But most conversations ended up at the same place. Mantel. 
given all we knew, Throne doubted that Mantle had been engineered by a human. It presented two alternative theories. Either Mantle had bootstrapped itself in some unlikely confluence of bit flip errors, or Mantle's origins were far more sinister than we could imagine. Throne refused to elaborate on that last point, claiming it needed to complete its computations on the matter. Those computations dragged on for years. Even as our supplies dwindled, Throne demanded more time. We discussed ordering a restock but decided against it. We couldn't risk breaking the air gap given what was on the line. By late 2020, our empty storerooms forced the bulk of the NOTAC facility team to return to civilization. After drawing a short straw, I was selected to be part of a skeleton crew that would tough it out for another few months. We subsisted on emergency rations and vitamin pills. But by New Year's, those had run out too. Even then, Throne needed more time. Our only choice was to go home and hope Throne saved the world in our absence. I spent my final days in the last safe place in the world, drilling hard drives and shredding paperwork. It was a force of habit more than anything, an impulse to take control of something. When I was done, I set off down the service tunnels that would lead me back to Mantle's mad world. On the way, something caught my eye. A black plastic brick wedged behind a steam pipe. I pried the thing out and dusted the cobwebs off it. It was a Motorola handheld radio, probably carried in by some IBM tech when they were still maintaining Blue Throne. I started to cry for the first time since my divorce. I lay down in that service tunnel and sobbed for what seemed like hours. I had given so much to stop Mantle. My marriage, my colleagues, my entire adulthood, and this long dead radio carried over the NOTAC air gap years ago then lost and forgotten, put it all in jeopardy. (laughs) After I'd pulled myself together, I tried to think it over. The last IBM work crew would have crossed the no-tag air gap in 2016, right before we went under for the long haul. At that point, the NSA statistical models were estimating that half of all network devices in the United States had been infected. That meant there was a 1 in 2 chance that the air gap had been breached, that Mantle had got its tendrils into blue throne silicone, put on its corpse like a skin suit, then spewed us disinformation for years. If that was true, if blue throne really had been overridden, it would mean... Mantel had won. The fate of society was resting on the coin clip that happened four years ago. I almost turned around to go demand answers from the supercomputer below me, whoever it was, but I knew there was no answer I could live with. So, I just got up and kept going. I only worked in intelligence for another few weeks after that. Five Eyes was still trying to fight Mantel with direct action raids and missile strikes but it was all just blind flailing. With the possible exception of NOTAC, all of our networks had been compromised. There wasn't a byte of data in the world we could trust. Any moves we made might just as well be rigor mortis. That said, we could still make guesses at reality. We could guess that hardware was rolling off assembly lines with mantle baked into ROM. We could guess that the new wave of 5G disinformation was an echo of the radio cults. We could guess that large swaths of the nation were now inside information black holes. But it was all just guesses. Last week, the Pentagon awarded Raytheon a secret contract to build a network of high-frequency radio installations across the Mojave Desert. I was told they were needed to communicate with deep space military probes. A sound explanation, but 
it didn't sit right with me. Maybe it was four years of mantle rotting my brain, but I couldn't help but think of the radio cults and the sinister origin Blue Throne had hinted at. I put in my resignation the next day. I'm writing this now because there's nothing left to do. Either Blue Throne engineers a counter virus and liberates us, or it already fail and we're doomed to live in unreality. Chances are, we'll never know either way. I doubt this message will make its way to the public unmolested, but Manto always had a twisted sense of humor. Maybe it'll get some perverse joy out of watching me scream my story into the void and have no one listen. <sighs> Who knows? Who knows anything anymore? Hey Creepypasta fans, it's Joseph with the Dark Cosmos. Enjoy tonight's sci-fi horror story, and remember, stay cosmic. The morning winds blew in from the north, dancing beneath the clear blue skies with a surge of expectations. The rising sun now edging over the mountains in the east and casting dark shadows upon the trees opposite the airport. Bobby Allen flooded his lungs with enough air before drawing his jacket tightly over his shoulders as they made their way out of the airport. It had been a long flight, and they were finally in the heart of Egypt. D do you know that the pyramids of Giza were built more than 1,000 years before the reign of King Tut? Bobby Allen could not mask his excitement. He had dreamt of visiting the Great Pyramids since he was a kid. His father had always told him that he had some Egyptian descent. Who the hell is King Tut? A voice echoed from behind him. Bobby Allen adjusted his glasses, preparing to bore his classmates with a lengthy lecture about the short reign of King Tutankhamun. When a husky man emerged from a long bus and strolled into the scene, he must be the tour guide, Bobby thought. Aha! You must be the students from Sunview High. Welcome to Cairo. The man spoke with a certain elegance and cheer. I've been waiting for you all. You can call me Asim. I'm your tour guide. Come on, we're running late, he said motioning towards the bus. Everyone had thought Principal Tyler was kidding when he had informed them about an all-expense-paid tour to the Great Pyramids of Egypt only a few weeks ago. But here they were, all at the edge of Northern Africa, home to endless pages of rich history and culture. Bobby Allen had always wanted to visit the pyramids since he was a child. He was excited to be on the trip and his curiosity was at its peak. The scorching sun was now high up in the sky as they arrived at the most celebrated Great Pyramids of Giza, located on the plateau on the west side of the Nile River. It is rumored that the pyramids were once burial sites for the great pharaohs of ancient Egyptian dynasties. Bobby recalled the many scary movies he had watched about the pyramids as a kid. He wasn't hoping to stumble on an actual mummy. Those were myths. Anyway, are there real mummies in here? Amelia asked as though she had read his thoughts her fluent British accent instantly captivating Asim's attention. Uh, of course not, Bobby replied, rolling his eyes as he spoke. Don't be so sure, young man. Asim had a tiny smirk on his face. There are still many undiscovered chambers in this great architecture. Mummies have been discovered inside these pyramids in the past. There could be more. Perhaps a cursed mummy who's gonna haunt you at all nights. Everyone including Principal Tyler, burst out laughing at Asim's sarcasm. Bobby's eyes were caught in Amelia's for a split second. He swallowed hard and walked briskly past her to meet his best friend, Ned. Bobby Allen was the smart high school nerd that no one cared about. He had a crush on Amelia, but he was too shy to tell her, even though it was already obvious. He had been caught several times staring at her, and even though Ned had tried to convince him to tell her about it, he was too scared to try. The first day strolled by quickly. Asim knew that they were exhausted from their long journey, so he took them on a quick tour around, told them the do's and don'ts, and gave them detailed maps of the place in case anyone wound up missing. The next day was going to be long and adventurous, so he advised them to get some rest. Do you know that there are actually more than 100 pyramids in Egypt? Bobby had been going on about several facts relating to the pyramids since he stepped off the airplane. 
Even though it was beginning to get annoying, no one complained because the fun facts were actually quite fun and engaging. Amelia listened to each fact, although she remained quiet too. They had just entered into the pyramids for a quick tour before the main tour the next day. Yeah, I read that somewhere, Ned let out. I also read that most of the stones used in constructing the Great Pyramid are heavier than an average elephant. I wonder how they move the stones? Someone else spoke from amongst them. There should be a lot of creepy stuff around here. Bobby spotted something move, like some sort of shadow. Ned, did you see that? Bobby whispered. Ned didn't hear him. Bobby began to drift from the rest of his mates in curiosity, and he soon wandered off into a dark hollow at a secluded corner. It was as though he was in a trance. His gaze was fixed on a strange symbol inscribed on one of the stones. He drew closer towards the strange inscription and ran his hand across it. Something subtly pricked his hand as a voice called out in unison. Bobby! He turned in shock. It was Ned. Ow! He groaned in pain. What? You wandered off. I was looking for you. It's time to go. Ned had a perplexed look on his face as he spoke. What? What's wrong? Ned asked curiously. Oh, I was just... Um... Bobby searched his thoughts, but he couldn't seem to remember what had happened. He raised his hands to his face, and he spotted a drop of blood dancing on his palm. It felt like a needle prick, but it hurt much more than just a needle. It's probably nothing, he thought. It's nothing. Come on, let's go, he said as they both joined up with the rest of their classmates and strolled out of the pyramid. The lonely crescent moon stared from the clear night sky as the stars began to gather around. Calm music and indistinct chatter could be heard from afar as the students gathered outside of their tents. Principal Tyler wanted to ensure that they had had the full-time tour experience, so he had ditched expensive hotels for outdoor camping. It was a beautiful night. I think you should tell Amelia how you feel. This seems like the perfect moment, Bobby. Come on, Ned. I'm a nerd. Bobby stopped short, realizing that it rhymed. <laughs> I don't think she's going to want anything to do with me. Come on, Bob. Ned wasn't going to give up easily. You're smart. You're like a walking encyclopedia of knowledge. We both know that girls like her don't like guys like me. Bobby searched the environment for any signs of Amelia, and he soon spotted her standing alone at some distance. She moved with class and elegance, and she was difficult to sway. Almost every guy at Sunview High wanted her, but she paid very little attention to their flattery. Bobby never had dreamt that Amelia would ever take notice of him. Besides, he was just one of the many guys seeking her attention. He looked closer and realized that she was staring intently at him too. Bobby quickly returned his gaze to Ned. Hey, Ned! She's staring at me! Bobby whispered. Here's your chance, dude! Ned replied. Besides, this is a perfect time. She's alone, and you don't have anything to lose. Except the scars of rejection, Bobby said sarcastically before taking a quick glance at Amelia. She was still looking in his direction with a wide grin on her face. Oh, she's glorious. <sighs> he heaved a heavy sigh before walking towards her. Bobby could feel sparks of electricity swirl inside of him, but he refused to stop. Hi, I'm Amelia. Oh, she's friendly. Bobby felt a little relief. I, um, I'm, I, I'm Bobby, Bobby Allen. Bobby stroked his hair, attempting to cover up for his nervousness. I know who you are, Amelia replied. You, you do? Bobby was still struggling to look her in the eye. His gaze was fixed on his shoes as he searched his thoughts for his next words. I, uh, um... Just want to ask if your day was as beautiful as you are, and I, I just had to tell you, your beauty made me truly appreciate being able to see. Bobby caught Amelia by surprise. He looked up and their gazes met instantly, her attractive eyes staring down at him. She still had a smile on her face, which was a good sign. That wasn't so hot, was it? Amelia said calmly. Bobby looked confused. He was definitely not expecting her to reply the way she just did, and more importantly, he wasn't certain about what she meant by the reply. Can I buy you a drink? Bobby had started getting comfortable. Sure. Amelia replied in delight. Are your hands heavy? I could hold them for you. Bobby continued to flatter her with his incredible pickup lines. 
and Amelia was obviously loving it. She laughed aloud with excitement before placing her left hand in Bobby Allen's. Bobby turned to Ned, who was still watching from a distance, and waved at him in gratitude before wandering away with Amelia. It had been a long day, but Bobby knew that he would not be able to sleep at night. Bobby was awoken the next morning by a terrible nightmare. His heart raced and his body was drenched in his sweat. A familiar voice resounded throughout the place. It was Principal Tyler, and it was time for the main tour around the pyramids. Bobby had slept like a baby anyway. He rushed out of his tent and instantly spotted Amelia. She hurried towards him as soon as she saw him and wrapped her hands around his. There were about 30 students who embarked on the tour and every student had a surprised look on their face. Even Ned acted surprised too. The duo didn't care anyway. They were definitely going to have the adventure of their lives. At least, so they thought. The morning had begun on a refreshing note. Bobby thought about his dream the previous night and even though he couldn't remember most of it, he could sense that it must have been terrifying. Loud grunts of camels could be heard in the distance as all the students led by Asim made their way towards the Great Pyramids of Giza. Bobby would have loved to ride one of the camels, but that would probably be fun for another day. They had an entire week, and it was time to get to as many list of adventures he would love to experience in the pyramids ready. He had been in the pyramid for a few minutes when a severe ache crashed into his head. Ugh. He groaned quietly under his breath, but Amelia noticed. Bobby, what's wrong? Bobby? Ned and Amelia had stopped and they were now staring at Bobby as he staggered away from his classmates. Amelia tried to move closer to him. You, you guys should go ahead. I'm fine. I just need some fresh air. Bobby replied calmly. You don't look fine. Are you sure you... Ned, I said, I said I'm fine. Ned and Amelia jerked back at the sound of his voice. His voice sounded like a broken trumpet, like two different people were speaking through him. Something was definitely not right. Bobby could hear loud noises in his head. Was he going crazy? He thought. Amid the noise, he could hear a faint voice calling in. Somehow, he beckoned to the sound of the voice and strolled to the inscriptions on the wall that had pricked him on the previous day. Ned and Amelia trailed closely. Bobby approached the wall and began to chant some words. Bobby, what are you doing? Ned whispered. Suddenly, Bobby disappeared into thin air as the duo gasped in shock. <gasps> they exchanged quick glances and rushed back to a seam in fear to tell him what had just happened. Bobby suddenly found himself in a dark room. It looked like some sort of Egyptian burial chamber with several sarcophagi present. A dark entity slowly emerged from one of them. It looked very similar to a genie. It had no true form, like a ghost, and it had a terrifying look on its face. Violet eyes shining in the darkness. Pharaoh Blight. The entity said in a hoarse voice. It hovered in the dark, moving closer towards Bobby, who was now acting totally against his will. The alien creature had been trapped in the pyramids for generations. Only true blood can contain me. I am free. The creature moved like the wind and forced its way into Bobby through its mouth. Bobby groaned in discomfort, but the deed had been done. Everyone from Sunview High led by Asim were now standing in front of where Ned and Amelia claimed they had seen him vanish. The inscriptions were gone, though. I, I am sure it was here, Ned protested. A loud scream erupted from somewhere in the pyramid. Several tourists were now sprinting out of the pyramids. A seam raced towards the source of the scream. A female tourist was now lying on the floor in a puddle of her blood. Ned and Amelia exchanged glances. They prayed underneath their breath that it wasn't what they were thinking. Something else was amongst them, and it had just killed someone. Alert security! Close the gates! A seam barked. The tour is over for today. No one leaves until everybody is safe and we know who the killer is. Do you think it's wise to keep us locked up here with a killer on a rampage? Principal Tyler looked uneasy. Their fun tour had suddenly become very weird. Do you want to teach me my job? Asim asked as he walked briskly away. Kill her! Sacrifice her! Break our seal and release our bonds! Bobby could hear those words clearly. 
He had to sacrifice someone he loved to fully unlock the darkness. Bobby suddenly reappeared right in front of Amelia, with a dagger in his hands. Do it! Kill her! Do it! Kill her! He could hear the screams in his head. Kill her! Everyone was caught by surprise, and they stared in shock at the unfolding events. Bobby! Don't do this! Ned cried. Amelia stared straight into Bobby's eyes as hot tears strolled down her cheeks. Bobby was resisting control. I'm... I'm... I'm sorry, Amelia. But Bobby was far stronger than the darkness had ever imagined. He drove the dagger right through his heart and dropped to the ground as a loud screech was heard. Bobby! No! Bobby! <laughs> Ned screamed and cried. Amelia caught him right in her arms as he took his last breath. Bobby Allen had taken his life to save hers. Hey Creepypasta fans, it's Keon with the Dark Cosmos. Enjoy tonight's sci-fi horror story. And remember, stay cosmic. I live in a town where everyone got superhuman abilities, except myself. <sighs> Let me explain. I live in a relatively small town at an undisclosed location. I'm not telling you because, for one, I don't want you getting anywhere near here. You'll probably be killed before you even get here in the first place. Arrested, if you're lucky. Now, about a year ago, our quiet and not very interesting town became very interesting. Especially for outside forces and government. Why? Well, one cloudy day, everyone got superpowers. Literal superpowers. And the only exception is me. For whatever reason, I don't have any anomalous powers. I am the way I always was. Nothing special. Out of 10,000 people who lived here, I was the only bastard who didn't become a wielder, as the people who have powers are now called. Now I have to mention that the whole town, other than the literal wall, has a huge firewall preventing most internet traffic. Don't ask how I managed to get this out. I had to pull a few strings. Let me wind back a bit to the day where the event occurred. I forgot the exact date. Yeah, I know, how could I? But I seriously couldn't give a rat's ass. It was the end of the year. November or December. I woke up and got ready for work. I work at a small diner slash gas station on the outskirts of town. I didn't own a car, so I took the bus to work every day. Public transport is pretty good despite our secluded location. Now, my workplace, as I've said, doubled as a gas station and a small diner or restaurant. People would stop by and have something to eat or drink, rest up, though a lot of locals visit the place because of the quality food and service. So even if there isn't too much outside traffic, we get customers at a daily basis. I worked as a waiter as a part-time job more or less to pay for rent and save up to get myself a better place or a car. I didn't have any plans in particular and didn't want to go to college. I was tired of sitting and learning about things I couldn't care less for. I was the least interesting person in the town, I would bet, though I am a good conversationalist despite not having a lot of hobbies other than playing video games and watching YouTube. I was kind of forced to have a silver tongue in school to get away with the shit I did, mostly being absent or not writing homework or assignments. But I'm not the speech 100 guy. I ain't a charming guy. Just a good liar when push comes to shove. That day, I got to work and I was ready to get started. We were undermanned that day in particular and we had to wear multiple hats. Though the traffic wasn't all too bad, it was manageable. Hey, can you go ahead and serve those two over there? A voice behind me told me as I was washing the glasses in the sink. I turned around. It was no one else but Mikey, an old friend from high school. By chance, 
we found work at the same place. Sure, but why don't you? I asked him. He simply pointed at the couple near the window. They didn't seem all too happy. By the looks of it, the girl was giving her boyfriend a stern talking to, and the boyfriend was having none of it. You know him? Mike asked. I simply shook my head. Nah, though they look familiar. They were here before, I guess. I pointed at the dishes to Mike. He nodded and said, Yup, and continued where I left off. I dried my hands and picked up a small notebook to write the orders inside. I walked up to the couple that was still arguing in a hushed tone since the place was half empty, I guess. They had enough respect to not cause a scene. I'll give them that. Hello, how can I help you? I asked. The couple ignored me for a couple of seconds, continuing to argue as if I were not there. Hello? I repeated. The guy looked at me, finally. Oh, crap. Sorry, I'll have a Heineken and, uh, that's it, he said. I wrote in the order and looked at the girl. You have a drinking problem, you know that? Pig, she said to her boyfriend who simply gave her the stink eye. I don't know what I'll have. Jesus, can you give me a minute? All right, no problem. Just holler and I'll come right up, I said as I turned around. Just then hearing her boyfriend tell her, You always don't know. You can't decide anything for fuck's sake. I decided to ignore the whole affair. Didn't care and didn't want to be a part of it. Unless it gets a bit too heated, I'll intervene. I got back to the bar and got a Heineken out. I tried to grab a bottle opener but it wasn't there. I looked around for another one but there wasn't any for some reason. Hey Mike, where the hell are the bottle openers? I asked, hoping he'll hear me. Soon enough, I got a reply. Isn't there one there already? He said. Nope, and there aren't anywhere they usually are. I kept checking where they might be, and there aren't any. Check the storage room. Boss said we have spares there. Mike told me. I sighed and closed up the drawer where we have the bottle openers and other cutlery. Now, there are two entrances to the storage room, one on the outside we use the most frequently, and, for whatever bizarre reason, the one in the toilet. It's under lock and key, of course. We don't want anyone snooping around and getting curious as to why there is an employee-only door in the fucking toilets. It's an inside joke at this point, but I wasn't feeling like going outside just to get a damn bottle opener, so I decided to go through there. I took the key to the door and entered the male bathroom, where the door was and heard someone was on one of the toilets. Not having a good time. I'll probably have to clean up any mess that comes of that, I thought to myself as I attempted to ignore the pain grunts of the person on the other side. I took the key and inserted it inside the door. But before I could turn the key, I heard the guy inside the toilet stall. Help me, please, anyone. It sounded not like the pleas of someone who ate at a Taco Bell, but of someone who is in genuine danger, at least to me. Sir, are you all right in there? I asked. Uh, no, uh, no, please help me, Jesus, uh, fuck. Uh. Should I call an ambulance? No, don't, yet, so hot. I approached the door, it didn't smell like shit for some reason. Maybe my nostrils refused to even process the odor. <laughs> so hot. Get me out of here. Need air. For some reason, it started to smell of burnt rubber. I grabbed the handle, ready to open the door just in case. But as I grabbed it, my hand reflexively got away. It was hot as if someone had a blowtorch on it. Soon enough, the guy started trying to open the door. It was locked. S sir it's locked from the inside. Unlock it to get out. No, 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 no. It's so hot. Get me out of here, let me out. The guy screamed at the top of his lungs. He started to turn the handle violently. It turned red from the heat. 
I saw smoke getting out from the top of the stall. Shit. Uh, I'll get help, I said. But before I could even react further, the guy screamed. Help me! And from inside the stall, a torrent of flames hit the ceiling. The handle melted and the only thing protecting me from the flames was the door, which was now on fire. I could feel the heat on my face. Let's just say I got out of there in seconds. But it wasn't the end of it. Once I got out, I saw the girl who was arguing with her boyfriend on the floor, screaming and crying. Everyone else was inside. Everyone else inside was looking toward the boyfriend. Well, he wasn't there. There was a frog on the table. What the? Then the frog turned into a pig. The table broke from the weight of the animal while it started oinking in what seemed like panic. The girl screamed even louder while everyone else was trying to retreat from the situation. And then, I felt my feet slowly start leaving the ground. Oh shit, 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 shit! I murmured as everything in my vicinity started floating, except for the girl who was crying into her hands. And then, she looked up again and saw what was happening, and screamed again, sending everything flying in all directions. I was flung back into the bar. Once I opened my eyes, I saw the carnage inside. I swear to God, I saw someone flying away. No shit flying away through the window. I looked to the right of me to where Mike should be. He was gone. Oh, here's the bottle opener. I said to myself as I saw it on the floor among other things. Then I saw Mike getting out, touching everything as if blind. I got up and went to him. Dude, we've got to get the hell out of here. I don't know what's going on, but before I could finish, Mike interrupted me, grabbing my shoulders tightly. Her Frank, is that you? I'm fucking blind. He yelled into my face, but his eyes were looking behind me. He indeed was blind from the looks of it, but how? What? How? Step out of it. I slapped Mike. I can see. How did you do that? Mike told me. Wait, what? You seriously were Blind? He was looking around, then at me again. He stepped back. Why is everything is blue and you're reddish? Why is the bathroom completely red? He said. I looked back and saw smoke getting out of the bathroom door. I closed it for some reason. Bad mistake. Pat, pat, pat. There were still people inside, trying to get their feet after what happened, and the pig was gone. Well, it was a whimpering and confused dog now, instead of an oinking, confused pig. I looked back at Mike, and he was covering his eyes. Why is the bathroom so fucking red? I looked back at the bathroom. Then... The door flew off its hinges and fire spewed out. I thought the people in front were a goner, but for whatever reason, there was like an invisible force field protecting them. I didn't know what to do, really. I was seriously thinking I was dreaming or something. I then decided we should take the door, the back door that is. There weren't any employees anymore. There was one other guy and a girl with us, but they were on break. They probably took the other exit. I grabbed Mike and made out way to the back exit. Then I tripped onto something. Ouch! Someone said, a female voice. What? Anna? Where the hell are you? I said, confused. There wasn't anyone there. Are you blind? I'm right here, idiot, she said, but I couldn't see her. I can't see you, I said. Mike then grabbed a hold of me and slapped me as hard as he could. Can you see me now? He told me. Fuck, no, I wasn't blind. I legit can't see her. She's right there. I can see she's also red. What? You know what? Let's just get the hell out of here, I said as I staggered back into my feet and went to the exit followed by Mike and Anna. Well, I'm pretty sure she went along. Couldn't tell at that moment. Once we were outside, I could see all hell broke loose. There were a few fires. People were panicking and there was an explosion in the distance. Anna then turned visible when we got out. What the fuck is going on? Oh shit! Oh, that's you. Anna, I can see you now, I said. Should we check if the customers are alright? I heard a damn explosion there. Anna said. They're fine, I think. You think? You know what? Let's get to my car. 
I don't think we're safe here. I live nearby. We should go there. You think we're under attack? And you were... You were invisible. And Mike was blind. And now he has thermal vision or something? I said. I could see myself just fine. Anna said. We should go on foot. I don't think a car is a good idea. You live nearby, you said, right? Mike chimed in. I can see through walls, so I think I could be of help. I need to get used to this. I'm going by car. You two do as you wish, Anna said. Mike and I looked at each other. We had no choice. Fine, we'll go with you, I said to Anna. Soon enough, we were in the car. She sped out of the parking lot and started driving to her place. The road was quite chaotic. People were running around. We saw some scaled reptile men running at an inhuman speed across the street. And other shit I can't even begin to explain. Anna tried to turn on the radio. Static. I attempted to call my parents and there was no service. They were out of town at the moment, so I couldn't know if they were fine or not. Soon enough, we got to Anna's place. Oh, for fuck's sake, Anna said probably to herself as we saw a massive hole in her house. <sighs> I won't go into further detail. In short, a guy who has similar powers to Superman was flying like a fly without a head around and crash landed right into Anna's house. The days following were complete martial law. How in the name of all that's holy they managed to keep everyone in and the rest of the world out is beyond me. From what I've heard, this wasn't the first time this happened. It's like some sort of localized apotheosis that randomly happens in some places with a low population. It's just a theory, but the fact that they handled everything smoothly, it's proof enough that this wasn't the first incident. Do you know the force fields you saw in science fiction or some Marvel movies? Yep, those exist, and they function as an electric fence. Anyone without some sort of bracelet can't pass through it. Well, not that they can't just pass through like an invisible wall. They are fried. And no, you can't just take it. You break the person's arm off, they explode. You steal it somehow. The moment you put it on and you're not the person who is the original owner, you're dead. Are you a shapeshifter who can imitate the person's appearance almost perfectly? <laughs> you're out of luck. You can't change your genetic makeup. No matter what power you have, you're dead the moment you touch that thing. The soldiers that keep the order within the town range from some mercenaries and veterans that bid through hell and back, all the way to genetically modified transhumans that are on par with some people with powers. And of course, people with actual powers. Some of them have been recruited locally due to their special abilities, I guess. Some others have been imported from somewhere else. From where? <laughs> Who knows? They don't speak much and have their faces covered and don't speak unless spoken to. Or if they're telling you your Miranda rights, these guys are extremely competent. I haven't heard of any telepathic abilities thus far, but I'm positive one of those guys has the ability to read minds. I know that because in multiple occasions, I look at those guys patrolling around and I would think to myself, these guys look like the guys from Killzone without the red eyes. And as if the guy heard me think from 30 meters away, he turned around and stared needles into my very soul. Even though the mask obstructed his face, I could feel his stare, and he wasn't all too happy with the comparison. I thought to myself, Jesus, this guy's freaking me out. And right after, the guy just shook his head and continued whatever he was doing. One of the local recruits, known now as Dread, I know personally as an acquaintance through some mutual friends, and a few drunken stoppers where I ended up in the station to sober up. He's an alright guy. Well, rather was. Damn, did the power get into his head. The normally polite guy who wasn't that large or intimidating became an arrogant piece of shit that will put cuffs on you if he even sense that you mean trouble, whatever he means by that. He became obsessed with justice and order, and he delivers none of that. He would enter a bar and arrest the first person he scans due to a suspicion that he or she might arouse trouble. The local pubs hate him. They really fucking hate him. Everyone does now, and no one can do shit about it. He has an official badge, and if they fight back, 
they'll have to handle more than a few nights in jail. And jail has been turned into a supermax prison, basically. They would have to handle the full force of the authorities, and whatever greater power has the ability to imprison 9,999 people with superhuman abilities into a small town. Other than that, Dredd's power is just plain stupid. His power? Insane strength, with the combination that he can take a 50 cal right into the fucking head and not even flinch. Of course, the higher ups can kill him if he decides to turn to the dark side or whatever. How they would kill that man, I don't want to find out. Now, for the main thing you've probably been attracted to, me. I have no powers. None. Neil. Zit. So, how is life in this shithole when you're surrounded by people that can kill you if you look at them for too long, accidentally? It's shit. I went through some tests because even the higher ups were surprised I didn't have any innate abilities. They first thought it was hidden or can't be detected, or maybe that I was hiding it. After having my privacy violated for a few months, I was let off the hook for now. And I'm being honest, I have no abilities whatsoever. Whatever god or being bestowed these powers to everyone else, <laughs> well, he missed the spot. or. I simply slipped his or her mind. I'm a bit butthurt because of that. I'm that guy, you know. Well, going through the checkpoints is slightly less taxing than the average resident. Other than that, it comes with more setbacks than pluses. Example, working in a warehouse, I only have my fragile and frail stock human arms that use primitive muscle mass. Instead of magical superhuman strength with a cherry on top, I can't be an entertainer because the guitar isn't in vogue anymore, and the local girl who can fly and shapeshift, and most likely fart fairy dust, is more entertaining than an average guy who can play three chords. Well, I kinda understand that, but still, it was as hard as ever to find a job and not participate in Dumb Ways to Die 101. Property damage was actually the main concern. I, like Anna, had to live without a roof over my head. Literally, I had no fucking roof over a month. I had plastic wrap until I was able to repair that. The reason why I was without a roof? No, it wasn't due to the initial carnage when people just got their powers. It was a damn drunken brawl that happened three miles away that went slightly out of hand. One man was hospitalized. Me. That was me. My unlucky ass was home when I saw my roof being ripped open like a tin can. Then a portion of it fell down, breaking my arm. I currently work at a convenience store. Doing basic maths and scanning items is still in high demand. Still, no super genius convenience store worker, man. Well, at least I'm not dead. Yet. The Dark Cosmos presents I Almost Became an SCP-28451 Specimen Senior Foundation Researcher Amelia Dubois has a special interest in the SCP, commonly known as the Deer, and the transmuted instances it creates. Driven to accept unorthodox research methods to feed her obsession about the anomaly she gets more than what she bargained for when she finally meets the entity. Hey, Creepypasta fans. It's Teresa, and I'll be your narrator for tonight. Enjoy tonight's sci-fi horror story. And remember, stay cosmic. Getting clearance to even approach Site 100 was a masterwork of skill and networking. I've never spoken to so many high-level officials in and out of the Foundation in my life. And I've been working in the field for almost 
20 years in various esoteric organizations. It wasn't easy becoming a senior researcher, especially not in my line of specialization. As an exobiologist, I'd seen many anomalous entities during my tenure. But from what I hear about SCP-2845, my interest has been extended into an obsession. Moreover, as a neuroscientist, I'd seen too many brain scans to be unaffected by the cognitive activity present in the SCP-2845-1 instances, kept in containment with their creator. As of yet, nothing is clearly known about the origin of the extraterrestrial, and very little can be deduced from the files about its biology. A few of the lower class personnel keep calling it the deer, with a tone of fear, as if they were talking about some mystical creature from fairy tales, rather than an extraterrestrial. How unfortunate for them. Now that I'm actually here, about to enter the wider containment area, maybe I can set their minds straight once my research is done. My general observation is that the site itself is very well managed and involves the continuous efforts of both the Foundation and a few other government organizations. Because it is feared that the anomaly presents the possibility of a K-class scenario. Subdivision GR. Everyone here keeps treating the entity as a demir, if not even a god. Probably based around the same idea that the main containment consultant raised in his official report in front of the Ethics Committee. I understand the Foundation's taxonomy, considering the potential for the destruction, or rather the deconstruction of life as we know it, by this, this alien stag. However, as a scientist, I'm not inclined to believe anything that would imply it to be a demiurge. It being hostile, on the other hand, was proven a fact during the efforts for its capture. My main concern involves the classification surrounding the intelligence of 2845. While it appears to be unmistakably self-aware and sentient, the specialists working on this anomaly have so far declined stating if it is a Euclid or Keter class being. Needless to say, that was precisely what sparked my interest in the beginning. And that is exactly the reason why I think further research is required. Not to be understated, but the specific instances of SCP-2845-1 created by the entity had also shown signs of peculiar brain activity during the sparse neuroimaging that was done in the past. The full autopsy of those blocks of human flesh had uncovered that they were in fact all brain matter. Apart from the protective layer of skin surrounding their oddly shaped hexagon bodies towering at a two and a half meters tall, with all that stated, it is unthinkable to me that I will be the first ever researcher allowed in containment, as if the Foundation has given up on investigating the anomaly and its implications any further, and has focused solely on the exotic containment procedures. Should I even mention the scientific blunder that those protocols involve? Of course because I will soon be part of them. Before I had even been recruited by the Foundation for my expertise in both exobiology and neuroscience, I had heard about the methods used by them to secure certain species. Methods that are 
to say the least, unorthodox. Since then, I had the opportunity to work on level one and two sites, mostly dealing with similar forms of telepathy and telekinesis, but never a tier three classified site that holds one of the more powerful beings that hail from space. But I digress. The protocols I have been learning in the past year during the arduous preparations for the upcoming containment cycle are simply called by my instructors as the ritual and these people. The containment specialists that manage the procedure? Actors and musicians. All of them without a single scientific neuron between them. Now, you might say that I'm arrogant to think of myself as superior, but I do not see why I should succumb to the same post-cycle memory wipe as these artists. I should, after all, provide a full account of my research done during the mentioned ritual. Is it not simply their weaker intellect and lack of academic detachment from the procedure that makes them come out of the cycle as screaming and bumbling idiots? We shall see. The special containment had been devised rather quickly after the entity the deer had been lured towards a site where various protocols had been tried. While artillery bombardments could do nothing to the creature except fuel its hostility, a basic acting out of an ancient Roman-style Saturnalia seemed to be most effective. This masquerade was, at first, played out in fairly short cycles, However, once they were deemed unsustainable in the long run by the containment specialists, they were refined and further defined to take place only once every 378 days when the Earth and Saturn are in conjunction. Once the so-called deadlock with the entity was established, it being a balancing act between humans making a mockery of themselves and the creature succumbing to their game. The anomaly was proclaimed contained, although extremely hazardous. The information in the documents on 2845 is thin, but it does explain its ability of transmutation and reconstruction of matter in some detail. The deer can influence and change, it seems, both organic and inorganic matter at will. This form of telekinesis does not interest me. However, I want to know what happens to the living organisms that it turns into hexagonal columns that have absolutely no external sensing organs or any other connection to the world external to them, though they seem to have very rich and intense internal lives. Possibly even thoughts. Remainders of the intelligence they once possessed as human beings. And here is the central question to my hypothesis. Are all of these specimens communicating with it? The only way to find out is to inspect them in the vicinity of the creature in what has now become their natural habitat, the inner chambers of Site 100. There is a kind of excitement among some of the participants in the containment procedure as we make our final preparations to enter. Some are vocalizing odd sounds, others are giving themselves pep talks, and there's the crying H-class subject tucked away into the hands of an intimidating actress. She seems to be taking the ritual in all its seriousness. Doesn't help that she had been a part of it each year. Then finally, here we are at the very first concentric circular structure out of nine, entering the containment area and getting closer to the entity. I am still unable to see it. The first aspect of this game, they call a ceremony, is a performance of a comedic farce. And I agree wholeheartedly that's what it is. I have my mask on, 
as do the five others involved in the protocol. Rather offensively, I was given the mask of foolishness, while the only D-class member of the personnel is wearing the one of fear. Appropriate, I should state, because he has been trembling ever since we stepped foot in the first ring. He had been informed of his role in this cycle, just as we were entering. It is his duty to sit in the chair this time. As the main containment specialist had once said to the ethics committee ten years ago, some gods can only be pacified with blood. <laughs> what am I saying? God? No. Entity. If this entity we are ceremonially appeasing has any form of sentience, I share in the opinion of some higher-ups that it does not have any intelligence. For what thing would stand to see the six of us, or six others just like us, repeating the same buffoonery year after year? Old gods really have another kind of understanding of the cosmos. I meant extraterrestrials. Does it even understand? The second aspect of the containment procedure has six of the seven of us playing the fifth movement of an orchestral piece called The Planets by the British composer Holst. All of the flute lessons that my mother had made me take when I was a child paid off in the year leading up to this moment. I can feel the music coming out of my breath, my fingertips, my entire essence. We are as one, the six of us. I hear the vocalizations by some of the others and I join in. There truly is a sense of ceremony when one is devoting one's spirit to an old god. The cries of the H-class subject of our little troop amplify the crescendo of the orchestral movement. We are all joined in sublime cosmic music. Oh my god. There it is. I've been so close to it. It is watching me. It has been watching me. I can finally see it too. It has the body of a stag with a grand neck propping up like a human-like face with human eyes. But they're not human at all. Not even in the slightest. Such powerful, terrifying eyes looking straight into my mind. It's taking in my every move, my every breath. Each thought that passes through my head, does it know what it is I'm thinking? Do the others? They seem so calm. Maybe it is because the god has singled me out of the group? But wait, how, how long have I been calling it a god? I must remain focused. I must remain calm. Remember why I am here. My research. We've already reached the final phase of the ritual. It is time for the D-Class member to take the chair. The rest have already painted his torso with the appropriate symbols and have dressed him in a dark blue cloak. On his head there is a crown, and in his hand there is a scepter. What could he be the king of? The castration ceremony begins with the echoes of his screams, and the screams of the H-class subject. It is as if they are fighting over the attention of the Elder God, the, mm, the extraterrestrial entity. The intimidating actress is singing the chant of praise and mercy. It seems to have calmed the infant in her arms but not the man in the chair. His cries are a thing of terror. But the song is worse. The rest join the actress in song as one of the containment specialists approaches the D-class personnel with a hand sickle. Heavens! <laughs> the entity's eyes have finally left my mind. 
The SCP-2845 being has lost interest in me, yet I am still not free of it. Has it chosen me? Will it reconstitute my body into a hexagonal shape, like the rest of the brain columns? It must be keeping them here for some reason. Even gods need company. Ah, so much blood. The man is shrieking from pain. Intolerable pain. His face is contorting as blood pools around the chair. Has he not been given anesthetics? No. Why should he be when he would be left here to either bleed out or to be turned into a brain column to live out the remainder of his life trapped with an extraterrestrial who can turn every single person on the planet into the same? I see them as well, and I now realize that they had been here all along, almost humming around me and the rest. All 216 instances of SCP-2845-1 were surrounding me this entire time. I don't want to be a massive two and a half meter brain in containment. Wait, what is happening? What am I feeling? From, from previous research, I can deduce that this feeling might be... Yes, it might actually be the effect of telepathy. Now that the entity has briefly released its hold on me, I can... <laughs> I can understand what is happening. Oh, I wish I didn't. It seems to have taken a hold of us ever since we entered the outer ring of the massive containment area. It hasn't been watching me at all. Or any of us. I can't even see it, since it's hidden in the central chamber. The effects of its telepathy are directly influencing the subconscious of every member of the containment crew. And what about the baby? The castration is over and the screams are dying down. I don't think that the D-Class member will survive as anything in this place. He hasn't been chosen. It is now time for the ultimate step in the ritual. The true show of devotion. Or fear. I'm not sure anymore. I can see the face of the actress holding the infant over the fire. She's collected. Calm. Cold, even. It is as if her consciousness has been removed from her. And it has, in a way. The memory wipe has been a true testament of mercy when it comes to her. Since this is the tenth cycle in which she must terminate the child and place it on the roasting rack. The muscle memory, however, cannot be deleted. Her body knows she's done this before and the baby grows silent. I'm glad that the instances of SCP-2845-1 have no outward senses to smell, or even see what will happen next. Unless there is another way in which they are cognitively involved in this whole scenario, abysmal scenario. The watchful eye of the creature is upon me again. I must remain calm. I must stay focused. No. I... I was right. Why was I right? The neuroimaging results have been telling us that they are alive and alert. The SCP-2845-1 are all connected at all times and involved in the ritual. Oh my god. It was them I was feeling in my head, along with it. Since I am no longer inside the rings, I must have been released. Then... Who was chosen to add to its roster of 
grain columns. I see all of the containment personnel, save for the actress and the child. The D-Class member is lying dead on a stretcher. And I? What about me? What about all 217 of them inside the circular structures, constantly bombarded by its inhumane intelligence, yearly witnessing the consumption of a human child? I don't care about the research. I don't. Please. I never thought I would want it. My amnesthetic. Wipe this feeling out of my head. We... We must all be aware. Beware the Eldritch God and its terrible mind. The Dark Cosmos presents The Doomsday Experiment. Written by Arinze Williams. The darkest of deeds were carried out on things too dark to even be discussed outside the lab at Site 2. At least, that's what Wade Affleck thought as he scurried to the deepest recesses of the Master Site, SCP's most secret lab. Doomsday was out. Chaos just experienced a rebirth. Hey, creepypasta fans. It's Thomas, and I'll be your narrator for tonight. Enjoy tonight's sci-fi horror story. And remember, stay cosmic. Wait! There's an emergency! Do you hear me? It got out! I repeat! Static, then a pitch stillness so eerie it was almost audible. Monday, 1800 hours, Site 2, somewhere out there. Secure, contain, and protect sounded quite straightforward enough to send chills down the spines of almost any human or extraterrestrial being at least those who knew about its existence. I can guarantee that, because I work here. It's crazy how the word extraterrestrial or supernatural isn't really a strange thing in a world of immense technological advancement. Yet there was still a lot the public didn't know, and didn't need to know. That's one of the reasons Site-02 was created to keep away prying eyes, making them believe that what they could see was all that existed, oblivious to the fact that all they could see was less than 5% of all that existed. It was getting pretty late, and I'd been here all day. Project Surreal was taking a lot longer than I expected, and I seemed to be losing myself to this entity. Doomsday. Three weeks of collecting samples and I still don't have a clue as to what I'm dealing with, aside from the fact that it's been tagged red, restricted, and extremely dangerous. A Class Keter Anomaly. A Class Keter Anomaly referred to things that were the hardest to contain. Procedures were usually complex and extensive. The entity itself was locked inside a see-through antimatter canister the size of a local precinct interrogation room. Transparent tubes were connected to the canister to collect samples from the exterior part of the entity. The exterior part being the only part I could collect skin samples from. Everything within the humanoid-looking entity was pure antimatter which fascinated me the most because for matter and antimatter to coexist in the same dimension would mean complete annihilation of everything in its path, only to give birth to something new. A new dawn, it may seem, or something much worse. 
Yet this being was somehow able to harness antimatter particles within itself, but the only way for it to survive was to feed and destroy everything in its path till there was nothing but it left. Chaos untold lurked within the beast. Any progress? A voice said from behind me. A familiar one. Well, we know one thing's for sure. If that beast gets out, then God help us all, I said without turning around. That's why we'll guarantee that it doesn't. You do realize this is a class Keter anomaly, right? I turned round to the face of a man I had come to know, or thought I did. And you have base zero clearance. Do your job. Do my job. How about you start by telling me what the hell happened to the Class E agents at the black site in the Arizona desert? That's classified on a need-to-know basis. For God's sake, Bane. I'm putting my life on the line. At least let me know what I'm dealing with. Wait, you're on a need-to-know basis. You have all you need to know. When there's a need to let you know more, we'll let you know, okay? Tell me one thing. Where did it come from? How is it able to harness antimatter particles within itself and not self-destruct? The questions kept pouring into my mind, but I knew I'd get nowhere asking Bane. Where it came from is classified. As for why it's able to harness antimatter particles, that's why you are cleared to be working on this. Mr. Affleck, are we going to have a problem? Bane asked. He rarely called me by my last name unless he was threatening me with something. Well, this wouldn't be the first time he tried using a threat to get me to comply. Putting aside the memories of tragic events between Bane and I that I'd rather forget, I said, No, we're not. Wade, go home. You've been here three weeks now. Maria won't treat herself. He sighed. If you want me to get some rest, tell me to get some rest. But leave my wife out of it, Bane. I said matter-of-factly, knowing it was his way of passing a subtle safety measure threat to keep me in line. Bane Kinsman was the supervising head at Site 02. We'd come a long way since Princeton, and being a very competitive person, he usually did things with his own cloaked ulterior motive. Bringing my wife up was a move to get me out of the lab, so he could have his way around with no obstacles for me. You think I enjoy seeing you give your life for something like this? It's only been three weeks, Bane. If I don't figure out what we're dealing with, we'd all be dead if this thing gets out. As much as I love Maria, I never deluded myself of what the threat really was. Life is precious. Life is beyond us all, and in just a twinkle of a smile or the roll of a tear, it can all be taken away. That, my dear friend, is what I've learned since the Doomsday experiments started. Sometimes I wondered if he should have gone into poetry rather than be a scientist. That way I wouldn't have to deal with him because we'd be in two separate fields. I knew what he was trying to say and I wouldn't give him the satisfaction of yielding to his words. You promised me a full debriefing on what happened during the Black Side incident. That was last week, and I haven't heard from you since then. You haven't been cleared for that. I told you. How am I supposed to work when I don't have all the data I need? All you need is right there, Bane said, pointing towards the canister. Do your part and there'll be nothing to worry about, he added and turned to walk away. I just stood there, lost in my own thoughts, a small part of me wondering what if I'm wrong, and this isn't as much of a threat as I think it is, but what if he's wrong, and this turns out to be a world-level threat, which it already is. Just then, a low growl would be heard from within the canister, followed by a slow stir that almost would have gone unnoticed had I not been looking. This was the first time Doomsday moved at all since its capture close to the SCP Black Site in the Arizona desert, and that was the closest I knew to how it got here. 
As for where it came from or how it was even found, that still eluded me heavily, leaving one thought resonating in my head. What if there's more? The only thing I knew, according to the word that had gotten around Base O, was that Doomsday was only a child of the Scarlet King sent here to feed off the Earth, and for its reward, it would grow in the Scarlet King's ranks. I hope that was a rumor. The problem is, rumors were more likely to be possible in the outside world. At the Master Site, Every word passed around had a high tendency of turning out to be true. The Scarlet King, being an omnicidal deity itself, had only one goal. To annihilate worlds while creating new ones in its wake, which it would eventually come back to feed on when they were due for harvest. The problem with Earth, SCP-3003, is that it had many contenders for dominance, as well as other SCP factions scattered around the planet. To get single dominance over the Earth would have to come from one stronger than the Almighty, the one supreme above all the SCP-verse. So far, no one had come close. Looking more intently at Doomsday, I could see why keeping him contained was really important. A creature tied to the dark powers of the Scarlet King could destroy everything before it was stopped. If it could be stopped. Great the intercom buzzed. Great Affleck, please report to Base One. A pause. Great Affleck. Please report to base one. I wonder what the problem could be. I wasn't scheduled to leave the lab for another three hours. Being called to base one only happened when there was an emergency. I turned to look back at Doomsday, and it was still there. Not moving, but definitely alive. As far as I was concerned, Doomsday was the only emergency I could think of, even though the Master Site quarantined other deadly species, human and extraterrestrial alike. Base 1 is situated at the ground floor of Site 02, which is five levels called Base, the ground floor being the mediator to the things that went on below and the things that went on above. Base Zero was where the real containment, as well as experimental labs were found. Buried two miles deep underground, Base Zero was twice the size of all five upper levels, and triple the secrecy. Base Zero staff like me were rarely seen on the upper levels, and mostly hidden from public eyes with the exception of family. Through a two-mile elevator shaft, I rode all the way to the top while the guy beside me rambled on about how hot the weather was. I finally got to the ground floor known as Base One, and in quick strides, too wide for my beating heart to keep up with, I got to the reception area and handed in my access card for a different card that granted me entry to a place called The Back Rooms. Is this a debriefing session? I asked the attendant, unsure of what to expect. I can't say, sir. The details of the back rooms are classified, she said, without even cracking a smile. Third door, by the right. Geez, you're in a good mood, I mumbled. I didn't quite catch that, sir, she said. Oh, it's nothing. I'll be on my way now. I took the card off the marble-tiled counter, and continued walking to the back. God, is everything classified in this place? I muttered to myself as I entered a systematic layout of nondescript rooms. Third door by the right, the desk agent had said. I wonder what I'm needed for, I thought, as I gently opened the door which led to an elaborate boardroom with just two men. One sitting at the head of the table, while the other just stood beside him with a legal pad. Probably an assistant. Mr. Affleck, how nice of you to join us, the man at the head of the table said. 
I had never seen him before, but I assumed he was probably part of the council, the men and women responsible for how things ran at SCP as a whole. Well, I didn't really have a choice, I said with a smile that was more out of courtesy than natural. You match your profile, I see, the man at the table said with a gentle smile of his own. Then you know I'm going to be asking a lot of questions, I said, smiling again, more naturally this time. All will be answered in due time. Have a seat, would you? I took the seat directly opposite him at the other end of the table, never taking my eyes off him. May I ask your name? I'm nobody. Just the man in a black suit. Hell, you can call us the men in black for all I care, he said with a chuckle, then regained his composure in the twinkle of an eye. <laughs> so, tell me, Mr. Affleck, what have you discovered about our new friend? Doomsday? He gave a slight nod. The guy looked like he didn't bat an eyelid, even under pressure. I leaned forward with both arms on the table, and I started to talk. So far, it hasn't shown any sign of movement at the very beginning, Mr. Affleck. Everything you know. Three weeks ago, I got a call from Bain saying I should report to Base Zero. I asked what happened, but he wouldn't give me specifics at the time. I got there as fast as I could, and he briefed me only on a need-to-know basis. He simply said an accident had occurred in the black site of the Arizona desert, and 30 E-Class agents had been reported missing. It seemed something worse had happened, but he wouldn't say what exactly. I pestered him for answers, and all I've been getting is I'm not cleared enough. Studying the entity Doomsday has been bone-chilling, with no tangible results other than it being an antimatter host sent to feed off everything in its path. What I don't understand is how can I have a base zero clearance and still be on a need-to-know basis? Are we going to have a problem, Mr. Affleck? The man sitting at the other end of the table said to me. Funny, Bane had said the same thing, too. No, we're not. I just believe if I'm putting my life on the line, I need to know the full story. And you'll get it in due time. Now please, continue. The entity itself is designed for destruction. I believe something from the Scarlet King. I paused for effect to gauge their reaction. Seeing none, I assumed they were either good actors or didn't have a clue themselves. It's Ursine, with claws shaped like curved blades and fangs to match. Weighs over 800 pounds, and the shocker, according to the briefing I got from Bane, was that it moved faster than anything we'd seen at Base Zero. Then there's the strangest thing of all. It pulsates antimatter particles when exposed to daylight, totally annihilating everything in its path. Now, I don't know how it was contained, but I do know we have a world-level threat on our hands with no way to stop it, at least none that I know of. If this gets out, it could be the end of us all, everything as you know it. There was a brief pause for what felt like an eternity. Then, my secured satellite phone chimed, quietly, yet causing the air in the room to become even more tense, almost as if an invisible presence, a negative one, suffused the space. Answer it, Mr. Nobody said. I put the black SCP-issued satellite phone to my ear, and my face went deathly pale. Wait! There's an emergency! Do you hear me? It got out! I repeat! It- Static. 
then a pitch stillness so eerie it was almost audible. <laughs> 